You know, it isn't a time like we figured out like an alternative to the chair. Like chair has been around for such a long time. You think we would have invented something new? I mean, maybe it's in its ultimate form. I feel like we need, to, nothing we need to redo the table and the chair. Those have been around for too long. There's got to be a better thing to sit on and a better thing to do activities upon. I don't know. I feel like the medicine ball, that was an attempt at oh, yeah. replacing a chair. It didn't really work out too well. Some people do standing desks. They just forego the sitting altogether. No, it needs to, something needs to levitate. Some sort of anti-gravity thing just holds your plate of spaghetti mm. in suspension. Okay. While you, I don't know. I'll work on it. I'll get back to you. Yeah, on yeah. When I replace the chair. Yeah, do that. With something better. <laughs> yes. Take something that doesn't need to be improved at all <laughs> and try to improve it. <laughs> Sounds like a good use of time. Definitely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Speaking of taking something in its ultimate form uh, and not improving it, I think we're ready for that. It ain't broke. Pencast, right? Yes. <clears throat> Number 75. Is that what this is? Yeah, mate. Really? Okay. Yeah, boy. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 75 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about, apparently, 7mm dot ruling, because we got some comments on that. Uh, what ink colors and pen colors we predict will be popular this year? Mm -hmm. What makes more expensive steel nib pens worth the higher cost? Uh, when is it time to call on a nibmeister? Not because it's broken, but just out of preference. Uh, our favorite looking ink bottles, our favorite Lamy or Twisby special editions, and we have some random pens that Drew's pulled out of my collection that we're going to spotlight. He doesn't know which I don't know ones. what they are. But of course, we have fun nonsense talk. So let's go ahead and get into it with feedback. All right. Feeding back today. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I mentioned we were talking about cool packages and boxes. And you yeah. mentioned the Pilot Black Mat Vanishing uh -huh. Point used uh -huh. to come in that cool box. And I said there was some nib person out there that did those. And it's yeah, Kirk Spear Kirk from Spear. Pen Realm. Okay. Yes. Okay. So he does that. Nice. That's what I was thinking of. The little floaty nibs and a little mm -hmm. kind of clamshell thingamabobbers. Pretty cool. Yes. Um, the Anarchi 247 says, is it just me or does matte black sound better than black matte? And hmm. I was like, what, what, is, what is Anarchi thinking of here? And I went on our website and in fact, it we do both. Our products. Yeah, because it depends what the manufacturer calls it. It's Pilot that says black matte. Everybody huh. else, matte black. But Pilot with the vanishing point, with well, both vanishing points, the LS and the vanish hmm. and the regular vanishing point, and with the uh, black matte Explorer, um, it is black matte to hmm. Pilot. Everybody else, from what I could see, is, is matte black. Matte black, yeah. I guess it makes sense because you think of like. You wouldn't say black shiny. You would yeah. say shiny black. Yeah. The, I, I, I've never thought about it. Huh. But now that I do, I'm definitely like matte black better. You can't like unsee it now. I think I say black matte more though. I genuinely don't know what I say until you kind of point it out. I was like, oh yeah, they are different now that you mention it. But I... I think I say black matte, which I don't, I don't like. I don't like that about myself. It sounds dumb. Matte black is makes more sense. It is more descriptive as like... English language. Yeah. Pearlescent green. You know, you don't say green pearlescent. Right. I mean, you could, but just... Green doesn't... pearl. Yeah. No. Maybe. Pearl, I need to work green, on that. Green pearl. It's so, on the adjective. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Anyway. Okay. Thank you for opening my eyes up to yet another thing I'm disappointed in myself yeah. about. Appreciate that. We usually just go with what the manufacturer goes. So if we're inconsistent, that's because the industry is inconsistent. There you go. Blame others. Hmm. Um, Hills214 says, Drew, you need... The Badger Hair Brush and a Decent Soap. Oh, boy. They are the ink and paper to mm -hmm. the pen mm -hmm. and really make a big difference when all three are combined. Safety Razor Shaving has the potential to elevate your shaving from a chore to something you actually look forward to. Yep. This was not the only person that said that. Oh, yeah. I got a oh, yeah. fair number of people that There's a whole like, said, trifecta of shaving just like and, with and, pens, ink, and paper. Yep. And BK will tell you the same thing. He's like, okay. And he brought me a bunch of soaps, too. I'm like, nah, I don't need the soaps. Just let me use the razor. I'll see how it is. And it's been fine, but I did slice the heck out of my face on Saturday. Ooh. So I, I'm i going to consider using the soap because 
if you're gonna do it, yeah, do it. Like just do it. I just don't want do to have to try way. a bunch. I just want one and just stick with it because I don't want to. I don't. I'm sure I don't want to get into this, Brian. I want. I I, I see the practicality of it. Yep. I like it. I'm. I already canceled my Dollar Shaves my Dollar Shave Club subscription, so I'm done with that. Kind of sounds like you're getting into it. Joe. I don't want to do any research. I don't want to buy more than one. I just want to have one. I want someone to uh-huh. tell me here. This is what you need. I just want to get it. Be done so with you it. You want to do it? You just want to do it. Poorly. Kind of like watches. Like I didn't want to get into watches. Yeah. I wanted a couple watches that yeah, were yeah. nice. Yeah. And then be done with it. And I did. Yeah. You don't want to start like a razor collection. You just no. want a razor to shave with. That's right. And I want to get Fair all enough. super into it. I want to buy the same thing every time. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're doing that. You're you're crowdsourcing feedback right. <laughs> from others who've <laughs> right. done all the research and they're telling you you need these specific yes. things. So just get there those was, things and then you're done. There was one person on YouTube that I think they didn't mention uh, Badger and Blade per se, but they did okay. say that they got into fountain pens through a oh, uh, yeah. safety razor forum. Oh, for sure, yeah. So, and that reminds me. Probably them, yeah. There were, there, we, we had at one point a Badger and Blade coupon for the company way back in the day. Back when we did coupons. Yeah, yeah. that was like we during, did. during the garage days. It was days. like a decade ago. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. I remember that because there definitely yeah. is some crossover. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then finally, uh, Dandelion Puff says, man, one day Brian is going to tell a dad joke that involves a lot of math and Drew is going to implode. Wrong. I will explode because that sounds absolutely nightmarish to me. So, yeah. Thank I have, you. I have one in mind. I'm going to see if I can work it in. You don't need to. At some point. You don't need to. We've got other things to talk about. And I, I'm... <clears throat> So I, I have mixed... Just the thought of it is already causing No, 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 I'm not even pain. thinking of you. I'm thinking of them. Okay. I'm thinking of them. Mm-hmm. But they like because... it, Drew. They like to see okay, your pain. Okay, Here's the thing. They Here's like the thing. to see That's your face. That's what I need to talk about. That's what I need to talk about. <laughs> because on one hand, yes, I'm here for you. I'm glad that we've got this going on, people. Mm-hmm. But far too many of you were lolling at my pain and suffering last episode. They're like, oh my God, Drew seems like he's going to die. Yeah. I was <laughs> like on the verge of death there. Like, I, I don't, I don't know if cognition returned to me until I was halfway home. It was not, it was unpleasant. Mm. So, um, yeah, just, uh, I think you appreciate it deep down. That's what I tell myself. Yeah, I guess. Your face, your it, face says that it hurts, but I think it, it's doing your soul some good. No. You're, you're growing. No, I don't even want to think about it anymore. Anyway, that's the it only, for me. The only way to grow is to be stretched, Drew. That's the, uh, yeah. I'm fine. All right. I'm stretched enough. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I got some feedback too. I uh, got a lot of yes feedback on the seven millimeter dot grid. Who knew? A lot. A lot of it. <laughs> like more than we expected. Kind of enough where it's unignorable. So mm-hmm. you opened up that box, Brian. Did. So when it comes to anything paper, nothing happens quickly. But we heard you all. We heard you all, and we are talking about some things. I have nothing to share. Even if everything goes smoothly and perfectly and we come out with some kind of great product, it's going to be like months before anything would I happen. Will say, I will say Rachel was in are, favor of it. And that, that We're all kind of on board with that, it. That means something. Yeah. I don't know what the options are. Paper is not the same as pens. Like just in, in general, the paper industry, like anything in the fountain pen world, the paper industry is so microscopic. Like yeah. paper in general, you think about like, you know, I'm trying to think of, where paper is used, but like books and yes. all kinds of other things. Like I was going to say like newspapers. No, nobody really <laughs> newspapers. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, if you think about like how many books and newspapers and magazines and like all these things, there is a crud load of paper out there in the world. How much of it is being used like by enthusiasts for fountain pens? It's probably like a rounding error's worth yeah. of paper. So like to come out with some very specific product. It doesn't get anybody's attention in the paper world, like anybody. So we'll try to make it happen, but I don't know. We'll see. So, um, yeah, just keep asking us, keep giving us feedback, and you know, inspire us, annoy us, whatever, and uh, we'll see what happens. But message is definitely received. Lots of people are excited about it. So I'm glad we kind of talked about it. Um, I got some feedback from Stephanie Sues, 5889. Oh my goodness, if Brian writes a book, uh, how long will it be? <laughs> Lol, just kidding. Love you guys. Happy 2023. I think we were talking about that when we discussed our like leadership books and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you had thought about it. I would need a very good editor. Yeah. Somebody very that patient cut it down. editor. <laughs> very patient editor. But yeah, I mean, uh, my sister is in the process of writing a book right now. Actually. Oh, really? She is. Has been for some time. Ah, that's usually a, the way it goes. So I'm getting to see very, not firsthand, but like 
secondhand to tangentially how much work it is mm. it is grueling and hers is, involves a lot of research she's in like the it space mm -hmm. it's about like empathy and coding so it, it involves a lot of like some psychology type stuff like emotion type stuff a lot of a lot of, a lot of like neuroscience a lot of coding and computer and history and all that kind of stuff it's pretty cool it's pretty exciting but oh my gosh the amount of stuff that she's had to research and write it's amazing i would never go through that much work because it's oh not my. my gift but anyway if i can just sit here and talk sure that's what i would need i would need somebody to just like watch all of brian's videos and then go straight put a book together <laughs> i could do that <laughs> it's not really writing though i don't know uh yeah it would be long anyway um xavier brenner 6219 said i would have to say kidney now is one of my favorite 30 rock moments oh my gosh that's my favorite 30 rock episode it is my favorite. Well, read on because you okay. need to make a decision. All right. It's really fun to hear Brian talk about 30 Rock. What is his favorite song from the show? Uh, well, Kidney Now. I mean, I love Really? Now. Yeah. Okay. I love see, that one. I saw this question came in. I added it to the document. Okay. Went home, asked my wife the same question. And of course, okay. she was like, oh, Werewolf Bar, bar Mitzvah. But then that we started good. talking about all of the other ones, mm -hmm. like Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that's a good one too. You know what my favorite is? Mm. By far, um, Heart So Proud slash Fart So Loud. <laughs> that's a good one, the Weird Al. How can that, Frank how can one? you beat that That one? one's really good too. It's really good. It's solid, man, 30 Rock. And they got Kidnapped by Danger, Brian. That one's good too. There's like nothing bad. Okay, but, show, but, but, but Kitty Now is still num number Kitty, one. It's, it's the whole episode, the whole everything. Yeah. It's, but that's it's, your favorite song. Um. Yeah, I haven't really thought about it much, but. Mr. Templeton. That one's good too. <laughs> but like Kidney Now is like a start to it is, finish it is. song. The rest <laughs> of them are like song. kind of in the background. Yeah, you know, kind of no, happening. you're right, you're right. There's so many clever things happening, but yeah, that's that's a good one. Yep. Yeah, um, it would have to be Kidney Now. That's, Midnight Train to Georgia kind of happened there. That one's pretty good too. That's yeah. like a start to finish song. That one's good. They did the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, and then you got, uh, you know, Jenna's song that like starts in the first episode, the- um, uh, Muffin Top. Muffin Top. Yeah. Didn't she do, did she do the first episode? No, that wasn't the first episode. They had the character, um, the uh, Pam, right? Yeah, yeah, they had Pam. Yeah. So they've got, they actually have a lot of songs. The more we started thinking they about really it. They really do. Yeah. yeah. But for me, it's Weird Al's, you know, heart's so proud. Good. Yes. That one's good. I'm going to make a song about pizza, and he's not going to be able to make fun of it. <laughs> and then he does. He reverses it. So good. Yes. Um, and then Henry TCA says, Brian looks like Putty from Seinfeld. I know he likes the show. Surely he's heard this before. Um... No, I mean uh, Patrick Warburton. That's the actor who plays. Putty. I looked it up. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know he was ever on Seinfeld. Oh yeah. Well, that's because you haven't seen the show, and you need to. I hassled Drew about this a lot. Well, I, I did. I it's did. Nine, it's like nine seasons. It's a lot to catch up on. I did Google him um, as he looked Is it nine seasons? on Maybe that's Friends, Seinfeld, I and I will say that as a Seinfeld character, less mm -hmm. so. But I, I have seen pictures of Warburton that I can see a little bit of Brian in, yeah. in there. Yeah, it's not like a dead ringer. You need to put. He's on got a, like kind of a scrunched face. Yeah, he's got yeah. A, he's got more of a like, your, your jaw eyes than usually I do. Aren't that scrunched? But I no. do think you need to put on a pilot outfit and tell me to welcome me aboard Soren and to be safe. Yeah, because then, the voice, then I'll be able to tell. He's the voice of the ride at Epcot. Oh, he's he's actually on there. He's oh, like yeah. you know, yeah. He's in like a pilot suit. Like, good job, buddy. Like with a little kid. Oh yeah, it's awesome. Love him. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I'll he's take the, that. He's the voice of Kronk, isn't he? Ah, uh, I haven't seen Emperor's that. New Groove. I think so. I know he's the voice of Joe in Family Guy. I never watched that. Okay, well, he's done a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, a whole lot of stuff. Anyway, cool. Um, that's it. Is that it? That's it. We're moving on to the Let's very, move on very to the one new th new thing instead of new stuff. All right, well, I have a thing, a new thing to One talk new about. Thing. It's a dry spell here in January of 2023, but we do have some Colorverse New Year ink, which looks pretty banging. Like it's green, a little bit of red, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of red sheen, some pretty, well, they call it glisten. They don't call it shimmer. One might One might refer to it as shimmer. But it's a very, very, it looks to me like a very fine shimmer. It's not real chonky. Nah. But it's like in certain angles of the light, you don't see anything. And then it just like glistens, oh, yeah. I guess would be very the best glistening. way to describe it. Very glistening. So that's on Tomoe. So that's going to like have a more extreme look of it. So I would imagine, especially with finer particulate like that, 
usually on more absorbent paper, you don't see the glistening very much at all. I know that's how it is with a lot of like Urban uh, inks, which have a really fine color like is that. pretty pretty punchy it's, though. Is in it? Yeah, yeah, in like terms of like quantity, definitely more so than Urban. More than Urban. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you this go. is a collaboration between uh, Colorverse and Benu. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, so. because they came out with the uh, Benu came out with the New Year pen, mm -hmm. which I think we talked about last week. And also then, green and I think we're out shimmery, glistening. Yeah. Yeah, it matches ish. Yeah. As, of, like right, red. as of right red now, we have a okay. few, not many. Okay, I don't know how many we'll. I think have. we're at a certain sizes or something, but yeah. we're not going to have we're not going to have them for long. Yeah, maybe by the time this video goes out, they'll be gone. But anyway, if you're interested, I think the ink is cool just on its own. Oh yeah, I don't think it's like a New Year like oh how weird you're using a green ink. Yeah, how in, dare you? It's in, almost Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's almost March. How weird that you have a green ink with yeah. shimmer in it. No, it would be fine. I like it a lot. Yeah, cool. And that's the new thing. So yeah, we'll have more stuff coming. We got a lot of stuff in the works. Always. A lot of, a lot of things. But uh, yeah, let's do some Q&A. Let's. All right, Drew. I've got a question for you from okay. our old friend, Potterwatch 221 b <laughs> Isn't that Sherlock Holmes's address? I have no 221 idea. 221B Baker Street. I don't know anything about Sherlock Holmes. Have you? I've never seen or read anything really? like Sherlock Holmes. Well, both mm. the Robert Downey movies and the Benedict Cumberbatch TV series are quite a lot of fun. I hear things yeah. about it. Okay, well, you can just keep and continue hearing things like this question. What color will be the most popular for 2023? Staying on our New Year's theme, ink and or pen color. This is a tough one. You put, put on your soothsayer hat and gaze into the future. <sighs> Prognosticate, not really, a Mr. Hat. Goulet. Not really a hat guy. <gasps> well, then how you how do you do your wizarding? Uh, I don't. Yes. <gasps> yes. Yeah. Most hats. I have a very big head. Most hats don't fit me. Wizard hats are usually roomy, though. Yeah, I would say so. I say if you did go hat, if you hats. did go hat, yeah. I'd say go wizard hat. Yeah, that would seems appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> it would mess up my gelled hair. Nothing's touching that thing. Are you kidding me? No, I it's basically rock hard. I basically put glue in my hair <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want it to go anywhere. It hasn't moved since 2002. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about that. I was like, you know, maybe because the last haircut I got, you know, I like waited a little long. I waited like six weeks, which is a bit on the long side when your hair is this short. Yeah. Um, and I was talking with the, the very nice lady cutting my hair and I was like, yeah. It's like, you know, I'm getting to the age where I'm just grateful to have it, you know? Yeah. Even if it's gray, like, I don't care. No. I kind of want it. I like, I like gray. I like salt and pepper. I think it's distinguished. What you should do, since you Men get the gray women. sideburns, grow those out and then, like, Ooh. comb them back so you've got those wings. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I was like, yeah. She was like, yeah, you should grow your hair out. She was like, you have, she, was, she, she said, you would uh, look like Patrick Dempsey. And I was like, that's not a bad person wow. to be compared to. Did Rachel, like, hear, did, did Rachel hear that? It was not. Con <laughs> it was not convincing at all. I mean, McDreamy. That's so. I, I had the, an attractive uh, man. Oh, he is a handsome fellow. Yeah. Um, I had that bear on my head during last week's thumbnail, <laughs> uh -huh. and there was more than one person that thought I had a man bun. Oh. Yeah. I could see you could pull that off. I have. I have a bald spot back there, Brian. There's no bun to be well, had. Well, that's why you got to grow the rest of it out. You bunch it up back there. <laughs> oh, covers God. up. Covers up the spot. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. Super stylish. I don't feel like the man bun has like me doing that and you with your wizard aged hat. up like that, right? Like no, the man bun was like a, definitely like a twenties, maybe thirties thing. That was a flash in the pan. Yeah, it's still it's still happening. I know not, some not people. A, I know some as, people with some buns. Okay. Well, there, it's a, it's maybe it's not as in vogue. I don't know. Why are we talking about this? I you, don't know, know. you and I don't know We're anything about, about style. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> a pen color. <laughs> what? Okay. Wow. Anyway. It was recommended to me that I should grow my hair out, and I tried to tell Rachel. I'm, I, I never wrapped up where the tangent oh, right, went okay. in the first place. Um, I keep trying to convince Rachel because I, I, my hair gets kind of wavy. That's why I have to gel it like this because otherwise it just goes everywhere. But uh, yeah, she's not going to go for it. So oh, certainly not. Because I think like you know you have the same hairstyle for like ten years, and you're like maybe I'll do something different. And I'm like middle aged. See, mine, like, mine I'm keeps, due for a good midlife crisis. I have the same style, but mine keeps changes because changing because I keep losing my hair. You don't have that burden. I don't have that oh, issue yet, but I I'm sure know. it's coming. No, it's I'm not. I'm sure it's coming. No, it's not. Uh, good genes in that respect, at least. Whatever. Um, okay, 
Back to pen and ink color. See, what I'm actually doing here, Drew, is I'm stalling because I don't have a good answer to this question. It's really hard to say. We can never really predict what's going well, to become popular. of course they know popular. that. Yeah, just, but I mean like- You just throw something to the wind. Yeah, but even like, okay, so in other industries like, uh, you know, fashion, you know, clothing, whatever things. Oh, certainly. There's always we cannot, like- We cannot make a data there are ta decision. There are like tastemakers and there's- you know, events that happen that like set trends and there's, you know, all kinds of like- well, Let's make some taste. Speculation and stuff. I'm not a tastemaker, Drew. We can be. I'm not, I can't. We just, we just need to be confident and just really put it out there like <sighs> this. Nah, yeah, I don't know if it next, works like this that. This is like Oprah's favorite things. Let's 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 just say like, hey, this is gonna be big. If we say it with <sighs> conviction, it but those will are things happen. That, those are things that have already happened though. She's like finding, you know, things that are, you know, she's making popular. She's not like predicting something that doesn't exist yet. Oh no, well, we, that's different. All right, let's just, let's let's try it. Are we trying to like Nostradamus size yeah. this thing? Well, we already did the seven millimeter dot grid thing. Diamond, yeah, we did that. China blue. That's a thing already. It's gonna be big. I don't even think we carry that color anymore Dang because it. it sold so poorly. <laughs> That was the first ink I ever used. And Dang the, it. We don't even carry it anymore. Oh, People don't care. Well, I tried. That's my taste making. I tried. That was the first you ink I ever used. You just ruined my taste. I tried to make it. I'm just I'm just I'm just saying what's happening. I'm just I'm just speaking <laughs> spitting truth here, Drew. Um I mean China blue is a fine color. No, no. It's <laughs> I just picked a random ink. Whatever. All right, what do, what do you uh, what do you what do you okay, think is going to happen? Okay. Um so okay, ink, I think, you know, chroma shading was a big trend last year. Certainly. I don't I don't think it's done. Do you think another ink brand other than Sailor will hop onto that wagon? Yeah, I could see that. Sailor's not the only brand that has chroma shading. Yeah, that's true. There's others that have it. I think it's going to be it's pro I don't know. I don't know if it'll be the same as Shimmer cuz Shimmer you know, it started out, Urban started the shimmer thing with the Rouge Hematite 1670 back in 2010. Mm -hmm. That's when, that's what kicked that off. And then, you know, others kind of got on board and then now like most brands have some element of shimmer to and it. And you could add shimmer to any color. Yeah. With chroma shading. See, that's the thing. Shimmer is like a thing that you add to the ink. It's so less you can limiting. Theory, you have a lot of options. Chroma shading, you kind of only have there's only so many shades. It's kind of like sheen. It's like you can only get it with like certain dyes, right. certain mixtures and properties. So your options are just far more limited. Yeah. Chroma shading is a little like that. So I could see chroma shading continuing to be popular, but I don't know if it's going to, you know, it's kind of like reminds me of, remember when uh, the Noodler's uh, Black Swan Australian Roses came out a long time ago. And then there were a couple other colors that Nathan came that had like a halo type effect where it was like, there was usually, one color, but then it kind of bled out to be like a different color. Usually when you put it on paper towels and stuff, like you didn't really yeah. see it on the paper as much. Yeah, yeah. So there was like a, a what is that that called? Like you use chromatography paper. I think it, I think that's what it's called, right? Which is weird because chroma shading kind of sounds like that too, but it's it has to do with like, you know, when, the, when it bleeds. Yeah, sort of like when you put ink on a paper towel, it sort of separates the dye colors a little bit. There were a couple of inks that started to do that a little bit and people were kind of getting into it, but then there's like, there's only like super specific properties of certain dyes yeah. that can do that. So you kind of don't have a lot of options. And yeah. Sheen, Sheen was kind of the same thing. Like Sheen is still popular. Like we're getting Studio Nitrogen, one of the most popular. But it's not like you have Sheen in like all these different colors. You can only kind of only have it in like blues and greens and mm -hmm. maybe purples, you know, and that's kind of it. So I don't know if chroma shading will be like that. I think we'll see more chroma shading, but I don't think it's gonna like expand and be as pervasive as shimmer. So in terms of what is going to be popular, I gosh, I honestly just have no idea. I don't have any sense for like what's what's hot, what's new on the horizon. Do you? I mean, I can only think about the inks that I think will happen and be big. Like Pelican always comes out with the Nadelstein. The ink of the year. Okay. Um, yeah. And be popular, uh, sure. we, we do know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be popular. You think it'll be good? I do. Um, okay. Do you? I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. I don't know that it'll be as popular as some of the other inks of the year. I think it'll be as popular as 2023. Sorry, I think it'll be more popular than 2022, maybe not as popular as 2021. You think so? That's my guess. Okay. Um, and then- I love that nobody knows what we're talking about, but we're just like talking about it. It stands to reason also that if Diamine should decide to make additional money and sell mm -hmm. full-size bottles of their green edition ink vent inks, oh, yeah, that, that would be those good. will do Those well. will be good, yeah. So um, now yeah. I don't know if any one of them is gonna be stand out, mm, uh, but those would be popular if they, they came down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I feel like it's been a while since the last Reddit ink that Diamine did was Writer's Blood, right? I believe so. Wasn't that like a couple of years ago? They haven't yeah, done one. Yeah, a couple of years ago. I yeah. feel like they 
did a few in more close succession. So hmm. I don't know, maybe they'll do one this year. That would be cool. If, if that happens, those are usually very successful. Yeah, I could see that. So um, maybe, but hmm. I have, really don't follow those. But we don't know like what color that would be. No. Yeah. So, but but Earl Grey was super popular and then hmm. Rider's Blood after that. I feel like there's a third one too that hmm. I'm forgetting. Anyway, that might be popular remember. if that happens. I don't even know if it's going to happen, but if it did, it'd probably be big. Okay. But um, pen colors, I have no idea. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, matte black pens. I think our next Sailor exclusive will be. I just said matte black. I was conscious hey. as I said it. Matte black. Okay. Matte black pens, I feel like, are going to continue to be popular. I'm going to just say a matte black <clears throat> Pilot Decimo will come out and shake the earth. Pilot Decimo. Yeah. That would be cool. Right? That would be cool. I'd buy that. I would, I would be into that. Yeah. It won't happen, but. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Haven't seen a new Decimo color in billions and billions of years. Have we ever? We haven't ever seen a new Decimo no. color since <laughs> they, I mean, well, they have new Decimo colors, but they, 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 didn't, they didn't bring them to the US. Nah. They had the what? They had the one that was like the 20 pen set or something. It was like 20 different colors. It was like an anniversary thing, but they didn't bring it to the US. It was just overseas. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Is that it? Is that really all we yeah, have to talk yeah, about? Yeah, that's it. All right, we'll just move it along. We'd love to know what you all think. I don't know. I feel like I'm very not in the loop on what's popular, even just in general, car colors, whatever, guitar colors. Well, you also don't, you also don't, don't like clue. predicting without any sort of, you know, logical ground to stand on. I mean, I can just say words, but that's all I would be doing. <laughs> that's all I did. My prediction would be based on nothing valid yeah. whatsoever. But I don't know. I'm curious to see. All right. I got a question for you, Drew. All right. Uh, this is from I am T Dog. What makes a resin pen with a steel nib at two hundred to two hundred fifty dollars better than the same at fifty to a hundred dollars? I'm assuming resin steel nib pen. Well, T Dog, that's a good question and one that I have been asked before. Have you now? Quite a few times. Yes. Makes sense. So yeah, absolutely. Um, my first thought is that, uh, you know, we, you think of these pens like Pilot, like Lamy, mm -hmm. that they have a steel nib zone. Yeah. And then after you move past uh, 150 bucks, you're in this gold nib zone, like no matter what. Yeah, it's a pretty like, like firm it's transition. A, exactly. It just stops and you're in gold nib territory. Mm -hmm. So naturally, and that's the same with uh, Platinum, it's the same with a sailor as well. Like I don't think mm -hmm. I've never seen from it's from pretty distinct. Yeah, yeah. all the Japanese so, brands have well, all pretty... the big brands. You you include Pelican and Lamy in that too. Well, Lamy, no, they bleed it a little bit more. If you think about some of the higher end Lamys, like the studio over one hundred and fifty bucks though. The Scala, they've done over one hundred and fifty oh, with, with a steel, steel nib. nib? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. And then you get, but it's the same pen. It's just yeah. literally usually, just the usually nib that's if the you're difference. over one hundred and fifty with Lamy, you get a gold. <clears throat> that's more the standard. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's usually what you're thinking of. And um, mm -hmm. those are all big, big manufacturing facilities. Lamy, Pelican, yeah. uh, you Pilot, Sailor, scale yeah, um, and Platinum. Big factories compared to what you'll normally see producing. The, com the companies that usually produce higher cost steel nibs in the $300 range are usually you know companies like Italian companies. And then you've got your ST DuPont in there. And while a company like Visconti say is world known and renowned and everybody knows what mm -hmm. the homo sapiens is the actual factory where they produce their pens is tiny compared to any of those other brands that i mentioned before lamy pilot like tiny 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 and so but it can be deceiving because the brand is super well known but behind the brand the effort that it takes to produce the pens and the country that the pens get produced in totally different you take a pen like twisby you know where their man, pens are manufactured in asia and then compare that like um for example i did a video on the penider twin tank touchdown filler and mm -hmm. that is a 200 hundred dollar pen yeah that has the exact same technology as a vac 700 mm -hmm. resin pen steel nib vacuum filler mm -hmm. there's really not a whole lot going on on one that isn't going on in the other yeah however twisby can make that pen and sell it for 70 bucks. Where Peniter, being in Italy, making the pen in Italy, 
they just can't do that. That's not even an option. If they tried to sell that pen for $70, they would be losing a lot of money because they cannot manufacture stuff in Italy with that same you know cost efficiency. They just can't do it. Yeah. Um, and some of it is brand. They just choose to not move pens down there so low. So you've got your Italian companies that definitely have that as a factor, but manufacturing cost has to be a huge point there. And ST DuPont in France, you've got the um, Defi, the Defi Millennium, which is a steel nib pen for over $300 under the ST DuPont line. Mm -hmm. And that's manufacturing in France. Like how many things can you even think of that are made in France? Like, I I don't know, in a given year, I probably won't touch something that's made in France. Hmm. It probably just won't come my way. Yeah, they, they tend to specialize in like certain types of yeah. goods. Whereas yeah. every day you cannot, unless you just, you, you might not even be able to sit in bed without touching something that's made in Asia. You just oh, yeah. can't do it. Oh, so for sure. um, I know that this is common knowledge. Everybody knows this, but that is one of the biggest factors when you kind of go mm. behind the brand and look at their manufacturing capabilities and what mm. they have to pay, not only in labor costs, but in that country's, you know, taxes or whatever. Like, I don't even know the details of that, but it's it varies wildly. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, where the country of origin has a, has a big is a big factor. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And then, of course, materials come into play too. And this, this isn't as common an occurrence. Like, again, with the comparison between the Twin Tank Touchdown and the VAC 700, mm -hmm. materials are not the reason that pen is priced so far above the VAC 700. Right, right. But in other pens, that can be the case. That certainly can be the mm -hmm. case. Um, just different quality plastics, resins, or non-plastics and resins. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't think of a time where I've seen, <clears throat> like, a celluloid pen with a steel nib. Uh, not a modern one, anyway. But certainly, mm -hmm. you can have pens that rise up in cost because of the materials that uh, they're being made with. Especially, yeah, uh, like, hand-poured resins, things like that. That gets the price up there. Like, Esterbrook, they sometimes uh -huh. use diamond cast. Or, um, yeah. you know, you'll see some people using Jonathan Brooks materials. Like, that is you know, cost prohibitive to make, you know, it's mm -hmm. one person making these things by hand. So sure. that drives it up as well. Yeah, it is interesting because there are some brands, I think about like Diplomat has done this, Lamy, they'll have the same pen. You can get it with a steel nib or a gold nib. Mm -hmm. Not every brand does this. And sometimes the price difference is quite substantial Yeah, just for the nib difference. So that shows you right there, like how much that nib cost can really swing things, um, which is hard to reconcile when you consider like, <laughs> You know, I, I don't have an exact number in mind because we, we often don't carry both versions. No. When there's, you know, because sometimes it can like literally double the price. You know, if you have a, a like a Diplomat Arrow, for example, you know, it might be 150 to 200 dollars, but with a gold nib, it might be like 400 to 450, and it's like literally just the nib that's different. It's like, is it that much better of a pen? That's not quite what we're talking about here, but you know, when you have, you could literally buy a Lamy 2000 or a Pilot Custom 74 or a VP or something like that for the difference of just the nib upgrade on certain other brands. Yeah. So it's not just the resin thing. There's all kinds of different factors and it does depend on which brand and all these types of things. A lot of it does have to do with economies of scale. Um, like Drew mentioned, depending where it's made and the quantities these things are typically produced. Um, typically what you see with resin, resin can be a lot of different things. There's different types of resin. Um, the most economical pens that there are are, cat, are like injection molded resins. Um, you know, there's different qualities to the injection molding, but think about a pen like the Platinum Preppy or even like the Pilot Custom 74. You know, these are injection molded pens. And so the resins, you know, they're, they might be translucent or have some color to it, but they're not going to have the same depth and interesting stuff going on that you would with a cast resin that's like cast into a sheet and then you have to cut it down, you have to drill it out, you have to turn it on a lathe. There's way more like time and labor involved in doing that. Does all that matter to you as the end consumer? You know, there's way more labor involved with doing it that way. It's not gonna be worth it at a mass scale. So they don't mass produce cast, you know, resin pens. It's more of a specialty thing. So the fact that it's more of a specialty thing then there's not an economy of scale. So it's going to be a disproportionately more expensive because it's a specialty item essentially at that point. So for some people, it's not gonna be worth it, you know? and it is interesting knowing we know a bunch of different independent pen makers, you know, they don't have anywhere near the scale to, you know, make their own nibs and housings and stuff for sure. So even trying to get any of them, you know, from somebody that produces them like Bach or Yovo, even that is tough for some of these small pen makers. If not impossible. So they're like 
already limited on some of their their goods and you know then they have to purchase whatever materials so it's literally just like their labor their design marketing promotion whatever overhead all that stuff that goes into the cost of their goods it's a lot it's a lot for an independent pen maker i, I mean that's how Goulet pens started out i was making pens out of wood and doing stuff by hand i mean when i tried to do the math selling pens at 50 to 100 dollars steel nib pens i mean my materials cost was that you know, and, and granted I was at a very, very small scale, but you just don't have the resources and the buying power to be able to, um, you know, sell things at a lower cost. You need to have like magnitudes more volume in order to get that price down. Which Lamy and Pilot definitely do. When they you, do. When you have on, an injection on some molded. pens, but like look at the Lamy Emporium, for example, that sucker is like pushing 500 bucks. You know, because yeah. it's a specialty pen and it's, it's got no injection molding there. Yeah, it's unique and it's got to be machined, all this special stuff. Is that worth it for most people? No, because we don't sell a lot of them. I don't think Lamy sells a lot of them, but they wanted to make it. It's a specialty thing. They had to price it where they needed someone to price it. Someone said, what's the weirdest grip section you can conceive of? And someone was like, oh, I'll show you. It is you. a little odd. It looks like a like a 1950s like robot arm. Yes, it looks yeah, like Robbie little, the Robot's little, arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of it doesn't strictly have to do with like, where is the value for you as the end consumer, you know, because not everything is, is so linear, um, as pricing, cause there's so many different factors. Um, but yeah, definitely the, the type of resin, um, and how it's made all that kind of stuff. Like for example, another, another clear one, since you were talking about pilot, um, pilot, the vanishing point has been around for forever. They've produced a ton of them. Uh, $168, the prices recently went up. $168 for a vanishing point now, but if you look at the vanishing point SE, same vanishing point, but it's a cast resin instead of metal. It's a cast oh, resin body. Right, yeah. That's $336, mm -hmm. double the price. Yeah. Is it worth it? Well, that's up to you, but for most people, no, because it's literally just a different body material. So like, why is that one so much more? It's because it's a lot more labor. It's an outlier that. to and their process. It's an process. outlier. They don't make as yeah. many of them, all that kind of thing. So, you know, there are all these, it's kind of these like, these like small batch type things. You know, you're going to pay a premium for a small batch or a limited or a special thing, generally speaking, um, especially if there's like any uniqueness to the material or, or scarcity to it, like with celluloid or something like that. Um, usually you have to pay like magnitudes of premium, not just like a slight slight upcharge or something like that. But anyway, so it's totally up to you if it's if it matters. I, think I would say you just kind of take each pen based on, you know, its own merit and see if it's worth it. But, yep. And if it's a brand that you have experience with and connect with for mm -hmm. whatever reason, then go with it. Yep. There you go. All right. All right. Next question. Coming up next is from Lorbs94K. Okay. All right, Lorbs. Lorbs. What you got? Says, Nib has a sweet spot. Now this is Lorbs Nib. Lorbs, Lorbs, Lorbs Nib, Nib has okay. a sweet spot with a higher writing angle than preferred, than mm. Lorbs prefers. So Lorbs is a low angle right here. Yes. Or just not this high. Lower than This, this the could pen. be super high, yes. Okay. Does Lorbs adjust to the pen or does Lorbs call a Meister, AKA a Nib Meister, AKA a Nib Specialist, mm. Technician, et cetera? This is a tough et, call because I don't have all the details here. Generally speaking, they're grinding nibs to be at like a 45, maybe 55 degree angle because that kind of catches most people. 55 preferences. is a little up there, but yeah. 55 is higher, but there yeah. are definitely some pens that are up there like that. Depends on the grind. 55 is way bit. too high for me. If I get a pen that's like meant to write at 55, it feels weird. Well, I think like within, kind of within that range is, yeah. is what I meant. Like they're not ground to be like where the sweet spot is 55. Mm -hmm. It means that like it can kind of go up there. Um, mm. Cause I think, honestly, I think most people tend to have a little bit higher angle, especially when they first start out. Cause most people write with like pencils and stuff mm -hmm. or their ball points and they're used to kind of like bearing down, right. you know? So a higher angle is, is not unusual. But with fountain pens over time, especially your your hand angle can drop quite a bit because you're not having to put pressure on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're if you're needing to like bear down on whatever you're writing, a higher anger angle is kind of more natural to do. But you can like just chill out and relax your hand as you get used to fountain pens. So this is a tough one because <clears throat> um, I you know hear some feedback from folks where they're like. I write how I write in my pen. Every pen I buy, I get adjusted to be how I want it. And that's just how I do it. And I'm like, that's cool. Like I respect that, you know, it's 
probably annoying to have to go through all that every time, but they just know, you know, particularly people that are like, I know I like a whatever oblique something or other with some amount of feedback. They get very specific and they're like, I will buy one pen a year and I'll get it grounded a nib show or a, a pen show by a nibmeister. And then I know that I love that pen. I'm like, all right, respect. I don't personally know that I like have such a specific writing style where I would be able to say that that's how I, I want all my pens ground. I personally adapt a lot more, probably because we are using and testing so many different pens all the time. You know, I'm much more adaptive as a writer. You know, I'm not like writing with one pen for hours on end every day. Yeah. You know, we're testing all different pens all different times. So I think maybe some of it depends on your writing style and your own preferences and all that. But I would say just as a general advice, like I wouldn't make a snap judgment, especially if you're newer to fountain pens. Don't make a snap judgment right away about like whether you should grind a nib or not. Get to know that pen first because you may find that it's a little easier for you to adapt to it than you thought. Or maybe it's like, oh, it, I don't like the way that it feels at that angle, but it's like, oh, but on this other paper, it's a little smoother. It's actually perfectly fine. So maybe yeah. I'll kind of just lean towards that. You know, take time to get to know it. So I would say give it a couple of weeks, maybe a month of like fairly regular writing um, before you kind of make that judgment. Because it's a little bit of a hassle to get things ground, you know, especially if you're talking about adjusting a writing angle that's that's a little different than just like adjusting the flow or wetness. Oh yeah, that's, or that that's a grind. Thing. Yeah, you're you're grinding. You're like doing stuff that you can't take back. Yeah. So, you know, I would think about that one for a little bit, but it's not like it's a crazy process. I mean, nibmeisters do that all day long, um, and I think it's perfectly fine. But you know, I would say if you if you're continually writing with it for a couple of weeks, and every time you're writing with it, you're like, oh, I just want this thing to be a lower writing angle, then. Yeah, maybe it probably is worth considering doing that. Um, you know, it's, I hesitate because like technically you can adjust these types of things with just like micro mesh and, you know, some like really fine sandpaper kind of stuff. But if you're not used to tuning nibs, that's such a crapshoot. Like, yeah, I, would, I, would I would say that, that if you're interested in that, don't start with the pen that you're. Yeah, like you can smooth you need some, you a need nib some a little bit easier, but spare adjusting, nibs first. adjusting the sweet spot on a pen, that's like next level you know you're taking away material yeah yeah and it's a lot of variables a lot of things that could go wrong so it's, yeah. it's definitely worth it to go to a professional for that type of yeah. alteration um it's kind of like going to a tailor it's like if you would buy a suit and you want to you know or a dress or something like that and you want it fitted to you mm -hmm. you can maybe sort of do it yourself but it's like taking it to a professional is definitely the way to go so for sure um yeah, I don't know. I haven't really done a lot of this myself. I, I personally adjust to the pens more, but I know other people who get all their stuff adjusted and yeah. they seem very happy with it. But I think that one they're usually reason, not buying like a new pen every month. They're buying, no, you know. One. And you and I more often than not are writing with pens not for ourselves, but yeah. for just the general pen community. Like, all right, is this pen what the community needs. Will this benefit our customers? Will this mm -hmm. benefit the writers out there? We're thinking not through the lens of, will I like it? We have spent so many years thinking through the lens of, will you know the fountain pen community like it? Mm -hmm. So that has, I think, skewed our brain a little bit. So now like I don't have a, but a couple pens that I'm unhappy with their angle. I, mm -hmm. I have, I definitely have a good handful of pens that I need to write with differently than my yeah. other pens. Right. And I'm just fine with that. Like you just like, kind of adapt. Yeah. And adjust. yeah. So for, to, to me, it, it, there is a benefit to mm. adapting to the pens and being a little bit more willing to, you know, dance around the idiosyncrasies of certain finicky pens, mm. uh, because it's just easier to find, you kind of just broaden your spectrum of what pen can make mm. you happy. Uh, and in my opinion, the more things that can make you happy, the happier you'll be, right? But that's not to say you shouldn't seek out the ideal. I think you should definitely still seek out your ideal mm. writing experience because if you have one pen that writes perfectly for you, you really don't need any other pens. You can still want some, especially- What are you talking about? If you love it so much, you're gonna want more. I'm gonna say the words coming out of your mouth right now. But I don't want anybody to say, oh, this didn't work, so I have to buy this. This didn't work, so I have to buy this. Like, that's not the goal. The goal is to find something that you love yeah. to write with. So yeah, um, I, I agree see. with you. I think that, you know, give it, give it a fair shake. See if you can adapt to it. And then if it's just not working, then the bottom line is you need to, it should make you happy. Like we would never yeah. want to sell anything to anybody yeah, that didn't nobody, make them happy. Nobody can really make the call whether that's the right thing for you to do or not. Fountain pens are such a personal thing. 
Like if it, it comes down to like, if you are using it every time and you're like, oh, I would really enjoy this more if it, you know, performed this slightly different way, whether it's a matter of flow, you wish it was wetter or drier, or you wish that the nib size was a little bit finer, a little bit whatever. You know, if every time you're picking that thing up, you can't stop thinking about that, then, you know, honestly, it probably would be worth it to get that Yeah, if it's stopping you from using your pen, then yeah, yeah, get it worked on. Yeah. Also, you know, there are going to be some pen shows coming up now. We're, we're through like the kind of winter the break. The dry spell. Yeah, the dry yeah. spell. So <laughs> if you get the opportunity to go to a pen show near you and actually speak to yeah, a there's, uh, there's nib nothing, technician. There's nothing like sitting across from somebody. And they can talk to you about your writing angle and let you mm -hmm. know, hey, yeah, you've got a kind of a unconventional writing angle maybe think about this. And then if you know that your writing angle is not really going to be conducive to any fountain pen, you might want to tell yourself, okay, yeah, I've got some things to work on. Yeah, that's pretty rare though. But I mean, I think I think what they can do is they can observe as you're writing mm -hmm. and then they can make adjustments and then they can also like, you know, give you the right terminology. They can tell you, oh, it's about this angle. So then, you know, if you've never, if you know you have a bunch of pens you want to have adjusted, you could of course, bring a bunch of them to the show, but their time is usually limited. Yeah. But if you can go and get like one thing adjusted and you're like, and they can tell you like, oh yeah, your perfect angle is- It's like is, getting a prescription. Yeah, your perfect mm -hmm. angle is like 40 degrees or whatever. You'd be like, great, I'm gonna send all my pens in to get them all ground to 40 degree sweet spot and then I'll be happy with everything. So that's definitely a good way to go about it too. Yep. Cool. All right. <clears throat> you ready for this question, Drew? Yes. All right, it's a long one. Best looking ink bottle from Sterine A. Frazier. Okay. Best looking ink bottle. What do you think? Best looking ink bottle. Well, what I did, Brian, mm -hmm. was I came up with my top three favorites uh -huh. and my top three least favorites. My top, my bottom, bottom three. three. Bottom three. Bottom yeah. three favorites. Bottom three favorites. <laughs> bottom <laughs> top three, three and bottom favorites? three. Okay. So top three in no particular order. I'll tell you one thing. I like mm -hmm. an ink with minimal, an ink bottle with minimal coverage when, mm -hmm. in terms of labelitude. Sure. I don't like that. I don't like my, I like seeing glass. Yeah. I like seeing glass. Yeah. So at Roshizuku, I feel you. obviously pops up to the, you know, right it's up top because very minimal labelage, mm -hmm. right? Little tiny square right in the middle. Mm -hmm. A lot of bottle. Yeah. A lot of bottle, little label. It's got that fat bottom on it. Mm -hmm. That big hunk of That's glass. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then Jacques Urban. So we're talking mm. the 1670 inks with the, wax and also the Jacques Urban inks. Just the 30 mils. Just, yeah, because they, it's the same bottle. Technically um, those are Urban, not no, Jacques No, 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 I'm talking Urban, about Jacques, Jacques right? Urban. It's the square ones. Um, no, the the um, the Urban ones are the ones with the little pen rest on them. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the other Jacques Urban inks that aren't 1670. The 1798s, that's what those ones are. No, no, just the regular, not the shimmery ones, just the regular line. Oh, like yeah, the, that's like right, the they blue, did. Yeah, we don't, they don't sell super well. They're kind of forgettable, but it's the same bottle. I kind um, of forgot about them. Yeah, um, they're, you know, they're probably, a, they're a bit of a premium. I'm gonna look it up because I gotta remind myself um, what those bottles look like. Oh yeah, they're just like the square bottles. Exactly, but without the uh, without just, the Just a more wax. simplistic. Yeah, okay. which I like. Very simplistic, not a lot of obtrusion going on, covering up the- These kind of look like the old Caran d'Ache bottles. You remember I those? Like, those? like the square ones, the old Caran d'Ache yes, bottles. Yes, they had a ton of like, so I liked a lot of they were solid like glass at the glass. bottom. That was Caran d'Ache. I, I like those, I like that a lot. So I know yeah. it's simple, but I love how distinguished it looks. It has that very cologne vibe to it. It really um, does. It looks like a fragrance. Yeah, it does. Or some kind of and like, I and I yeah. dig that. And okay. then my other my third favorite is the Diamine Red slash blue slash probably green edition bottle with the little four legs. Yeah, that's pretty that's cool. really unique. Those and, are cool. And it just looks fun. Minimal label. It's just a little circle right there in the front. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrapping around. I don't like the whole wrap. If it's mm. covering more than the front, yeah, no, nah, I get I ain't got time for that. How do you feel about the Diamine uh, like wedge? Like pie shaped ones. That's exactly that. That's a great point. I love that bottle, but the whole front of it is covered in a label. It's label, yeah. Too much label, man. It's a lot of label. But I love that bottle. I really do. Mm -hmm. But too much label, and the mm. label's really bright and mm. multicolored. Just no. How about Lamy? Lamy bottles. I hate the Lamy bottle. What? That was almost all my worst favorites. I didn't put it on Why? there. I hate it. It's so ugly. It's so unique. It's so dumb. It, it's like a. It's like a pug. Yeah. A I like the. I love the. Um, the <laughs> It's like so ugly, it's attractive, <laughs> sort of. It's like uh, cute. Yeah, my wife tells me that all the time. What's weird um, is if you take the plastic bottom oh, off the Lamy bottle. Oh, that's more disturbing. It just looks wrong. It looks weird. It's like a, a poorly designed like spinning top that just rolls sadly. Yeah. Uh, but no, I just like <laughs> The Lamy crystal links are nice. 
Those are nice. Those bottles. are nice. Yeah. Those are but good. no, Lamy's Lamy's not good. Um, so <laughs> I spe- think okay. speaking of my super three, functional, I love the function of the Lamy bottles. They are, they are no labels. Yeah. Which is kind of not ideal. Like, how do you know what ink you have? They have different like color cap on everything. Yeah, color. but they, I don't know. They that, that's too little. Label. They have the box. You have the box, but you have got to like keep the box with mm-hmm. the bottle. Yeah. My three least favorite bottles are Noodlers. Too much label. Yeah. Like, so, so their catfish label is fine. If it's just the catfish, all right, yeah. whatever. But he has so many labels that wrap around the whole thing yeah. and they're just obnoxious looking with words everywhere. It looks like it's just. It's a bit busy. It's so busy. It's so busy. Well, the bottle itself is like. The bottle's fine. There's nothing to. It's just a generic, like, it, it is. Bottle. But it, yeah. could, it could be fine if it wasn't that wrap and just completely cluttered label. Remember, remember years ago when he had to switch to plastic bottles? I do. I do. <laughs> That was uh, that was upsetting. that that's at a new bar. Well, <laughs> my next one uh-huh. is Organic Studio, and that one basically yeah, they're is not the best. The plastic. Oh, they're even worse than Noodlers because he's got, he's got that tiny little oval label, usually printed off center with like half mm. the thing cut off. Mm. It's yeah. it's the worst one. It's, it's not, worse it's than not, Noodlers. It's not the best. No, but it's but not the best. It, obviously, it, it's not trying to be the, anything the, else. The Diamine Thirty Mills are pretty bad too. The, the their plastic ones. Oh. I mean, they're fairly functional. At least they're they're tall. So you can't fit every pen in right. there. Right. So we're thinking we're talking aesthetics. Um, yeah. Best looking. If I was if I was just most, to say the worst bottle ever. Most plastic bottles don't win any if, aesthetic awards. If we were going Robert Oster is okay. I, I almost they put look Robert Oster on the worst because they're well yeah they're plastic like no plastic is going to compete with glass. But they, he doesn't even change his labels. Like they, you've got that funky yeah. thing on the top. Like no. I didn't put him on here because it's fine. Okay. okay. He's not trying to do anything, but <laughs> no, he almost got in up and change his labels on the top. But, yeah. Yeah. It's all that's, right. You know. It's all right. So organic studio, that thing's just okay. it's so utilitarian. That's fine. And then finally, private reserve. Oh, come on. It's like a soup bowl with a lid. <laughs> it's like a I don't even it's 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 <laughs> soup bowl with a it's lid. It's gigantic. It's way too big. Like why would you need it's yeah. it's like a it's like an actual cup. <laughs> it's like an actual cup with a lid. Like, yeah. I think something else like was... Like the some, lid is as wide as the bottle. I once bought some terrarium rocks. Mm-hmm. Just tiny little pebbles that you're supposed to use to layer your terrarium. I'm pretty okay. sure it came in a PR bottle. <laughs> it could be. It was, like, it, was like, it was like sand and pebbles. It looks like yeah. something... If you go to, you know, a craft store and buy some, like, little aquarium, you mm-hmm. know, marbles, it would come in one of those things. Yeah. It's, it's like... It's not supposed to be an ink bottle. <laughs> like, somebody was like... Had it got found a deal on these bottles. They were like... And now, and mm-hmm. I will I will say that I that alone isn't making them low on the list. It's that and the outdated labeling. Like PR PR needs to do something about the rainbow label. Like it's, it's got a clip art kind of vibe. Yeah, to I was kind of hoping yeah. that when they came back, they would come back with like a new fresh design. Well, they did freshen it, but they freshened it from like 1993 to 1998. Yeah, and it kind of <laughs> right. yeah, is still there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I appreciate the quantity, and and you can't say it's not easy to fill. It's very easy to fill from a PR bottle. I will say the trend with all of the least attractive ones you have is they're all the most affordable inks. Right. And usually have the largest quantity. So like you're definitely paying for these nicer bottles. Right. So there's no question about it. mm -hmm, For sure. But yeah, that's legit. Yeah, that's my two cents. I'm surprised, Drew, that you didn't put Ferris Wheel Press on this list because you are so into those caps. So the caps, I appreciate functionally. Because like, the, like tectile, they they seal, well. they seal well. So, so they've, okay. get, they've got a they've but got a rubber thing. Aesthetically, they're, they're 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 fine, but they have a okay. seal, and then the the thread has a hard stop, a molded glass mm-hmm. hard stop in the yeah. thread. So yeah. operationally phenomenal. Yeah, the bottle itself, I think is it's absolutely very pretty. Not yeah. not pretty enough to compete against a Roshizuku, a Roshizuku Jacarbon or hmm. Blue Red editions, um, because every bottle is pretty much the same, generally the same print. Some of them are a little bit different. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. But uh, if, if you were to combine the bottle and the box, Ferris Wheel Press would definitely be on there. It would be up But there, I'm yeah. thinking bottle strictly, because a lot of what Ferris Wheel Press oh, brings to the Roche table. Oh, packaging is pretty awesome. It is, too. it is, but I'm not thinking about that right now. I'm thinking okay. bottle only. Okay. It, it definitely would have been, if there were four that I picked, I would have picked Ferris That would have been up there? Okay. Yeah. I put that on here for mine, just because it's I like also saw your, your nose were already on here, so I was like, all right, he's uh, already got Ferris Wheel I did. Press on there. I was more on it than Drew. No, I'm not really. <laughs> Drew populate all the questions. I just happen to answer mine first. Um, I put a Roshizuku on there for mine. It's so good. Classic. Right. Classic at this point. And very functional as well. Mm-hmm. And just like the shape of the bottle is so unique because it's like 
you know, like ovaly, mm -hmm. you know, around. So it just, it looks beautiful. So good. Um, I put Pelican Edelstein. Beautiful. That one is one of my favorites. I love the heft of that. It's hefty. It's like, you know, it's, it's got, probably the heaviest it's bottle. It's got nice lines. Like it's kind of curved. A lot like of glass line. in the bottom. It's got a lot that of, bottom. A lot of glass in the bottom. Nice wide mouth to mm -hmm. it. Not too wide, but wide enough. You can get any pen in there. The cap is really sturdy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty cool. The only um, the only thing that stopped me from putting that one on the list is because the mm -hmm. front is covered up so much with the Edelstein logo. Yeah, and but I, it's not a label though. It's no, just you can like, see through it. It's just like an imprint yeah, like on an etching, the bottom. Yeah. yeah, or it's a, what it, I, don't, I don't know exactly what that technique is called. But yeah, it's like, it's like it's like raised, inlaid, raised, I think. I don't think it's etched. I think it's, it's just like, yeah, it's just like, you know, um, like on top of the glass. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's like just literally just the writing that's oh, on there. Okay. It's, not a, it's not a like label. It, oh, okay. Um, I don't know what that that technique is called, but it looks very clean. Mm, like I mean, an like Yeah. I want to say embossed, but that's not the case at all. Embossing yeah. is like a paste. That's not that you can only do that on paper. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is, but. If y'all know, post in the comments because I can't remember what it's called. Um, I put Ferris wheel press on here just because I knew you liked it and I wanted to bring it up. And then I had I had Jacques Rabanne on here too. The specifically the 1670 and the 1798. Yeah. The wax really does it for me. Like it does. I am super into that whole look. Functionally, it's awful. I hate having wax with strings and all this other crap. Same with like the Orochizuku strings that are on there. It oh, looks great when you take it out of the package. I get ink on it like it every it freaking ends time. Up getting stained, yeah. yeah. So that kind of stuff is annoying, but. It looks really good, which is what the question was about. So yeah, those are my tops. I, 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 I I'm, I'm pretty much in agreements with where you're at there. Yeah, those are good ones. Uh, now, honor, honorable mentions. I'll say Colorverse is very nice. Very Colorverse is good. You know, very yeah. creative there. Um, I like the simplicity of the uh, standard platinum bottles. Hmm. You know, very clean, okay. tiny, tiny little oval logo right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. Very nice for you know, lay on the desk. Yeah, there. Some of Sailors are pretty good too, like the this, Ink Studio. I, I love like the that. Ink Those Studios. Are simple. Yeah, they're simple. They're small. Very nice looking on the desk mm -hmm. for sure. I like yeah, those. yeah. They are small though. They're like not as they don't present as like majestically. Mm, no. as you know, like an Arushizuku. Doesn't something. have legs on it like Diamine. Diamine's one of the few that has legs. I can't think of any others at the moment. It's ready to go. Any? Yeah, it's 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 ready. It's ready. All right. Cool. Last question. All right, number five is coming to us from Thomas Horton Four. Thomas Horton Four says, Thomas Horton Four. Favorite Lamy and Twisby special edition yet. So there have been lots of Lamy special Ooh. editions, lots of Twisby special editions. Like Brian, ever? Like ever that's ever come out? Yet. Or like yes, we, which okay. was the best yet? Your favorite yet. This is tough. Oh, I'm sure, because you love both. You've got a lot of favorites in both of these camps. I literally, before like maybe an hour before we were shooting this, I was reintegrating all the pens that I cataloged, mm. reintegrating them back into my pen cabinet. There's a friggin' lot of Twisbees and Lamies, that's for sure. Um, the Lamies, I sort of broke them out by model because that was just an easier way for me to think about it. Um, so I did the Safari, the All-Star, and the Studio. Okay. Because those are like the big three. Yeah, and they, they, have, know, they do some other special editions, but it's like, what am I going to do? Those like three, have, They've those had, like, three have regular three, special three. editions. Yeah, the ones Annual. that are that are more regular. Um, I think, and I'm not like super enthusiastic about this above all others, but I when I when I, if I had to pick one, I think the 2017 Safari Petrol would probably be my favorite Safari. That's it's, a good one. You know, it's it's a nice dark teal. It's the matte finish. I love the matte finish. This was such a toss up for me between dark lilac, the 2016. I figured it would be one of those Dark two. lilac hit harder because they had done like four neon pens before that. We were getting sick And we it. were just like, please, anything but neon. And then they came out with dark lilac and it was like, what? It was like, so it was more impactful. But now, like looking back on it, like petrol was also very popular, and so when I look it was back, the, it was the year after. It was the year after, yeah. so we fo it followed up, and it was like, Lamy, just keep Still doing more it. of this. And uh, obviously, they come up with a zillion colors since. But um, you know, I think if I look back at my whole collection now, the one that like you just stands out and like really just I don't know, you know, because it's like I don't know, I'm wearing a sort of a teal color yeah, yeah, quite, yeah. quite as dark as petrol but right. yeah when i look at it i'm like yeah that's it's a good color i really like that it's a very good color especially when i compare it to the regular edition color lamis like the, the regular safaris 
And they're all like, you know, you've got the charcoal, which is also awesome. That's not a special edition though. Um, but when you compare them to the the regular line, it's like shiny red, shiny yellow. And then you see petrol, you're like, oh, pff. it's like not even the same league. Since, golly, um, since that, have they come out with a dark matte? Safari? They did the, um, they did a matte black. I forget what yeah. they called it because they- I feel like it's been a long time since they've done like a darker <laughs> safari. I mean, they did a purple in the when they did the candies. Um, they had I guess like that a, one was a little darker. It was darker. I guess wasn't I, quite as dark. I forget it, it being was, dark because it was always like photographed with the lighter, with its friends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was a more vibrant purple than dark lilac. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's the one that I can recall. Um, yeah. So, petrol would be my my safari pick. Okay. Um, for the all star, I chose the copper orange. Copper orange. That was from 2015. That was a good one. Good ink. That was a good one. Good ink that we got like 10 bottles know, of so ever. And they were like, oh, we're going to get more. And then they never did. What a tease. Um, that was really good. Um, but yeah, that orange, like just like, it's sort of like a diplomat arrow. Like that Something most popular about orange. anodized orange looks it just, so good. It looks so good. That like burnt orange kind of color. Yeah. So even, that the, was, even the um, the Elox, the orange Elox mm-hmm, looks so good. It does, yeah. Something about that orange. Yeah, I was thinking about the the red um, all-star too. The ruby. The ruby. That, that one's good one. really good too, but you know, I think the orange might might edge yeah. it out. It's it's kind of a toss up for me. They're yeah. both really good. Um, I regret not buying an orange. Yeah, that's on my regret list. Yeah, mm-hmm. I can understand. That was a good color. Uh, the studio, I really like the racing green that they did back in 2017. Yeah, but the aquamarine was also really good. That was from 2019. That was more vibrant. That was like this color. It looks really really mm-hmm. sharp. Um, but the racing green darker, but it would like looked almost a little more sparkly. It was kind of like that matte finish, but it it had almost kind of like a sheen to it. It was green with almost a bit of a red sheen. It was just really special. We didn't get very many of them. It flew under the radar for a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, I don't have a good memory of that. Yeah, it's but it's cool if you can if you can see it. We've got we've got a um, blog post where we you know show all the past special editions of all these Lamis. So if you want to go back and check them out. Um, but it's good. Lamis done a lot of good colors. And then for me, the Twisby, um, I didn't go back and do every single pen because I had one, I actually did have one that was a clear standout for me. And that was the 580 ALR Prussian Blue, which technically is a special edition, even though we've had it for like two and a half years. Now. Yeah. But it's a special edition and it just absolutely destroys all other Twisby pens, yes. in my opinion. It does. That was my pick. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like nothing. Like I thought about the irises. Um, irises are good. They're good, but it's like just tri- it's like I, trim. You know, it's like the, it doesn't it doesn't. When I saw punch quite as the hard. dark I guess the lilac, Prussian blue is kind of just trim too. But still. yeah, it, there's still when I saw the Prussian blue 580 for the first time, I was like hit. Like yeah. oh my like, god. Like yeah, this is good. I don't know. It's just a color. It's nothing sparkly or shiny. It's just. That color, like it was almost as if I had never seen that color before. Like that mm. perfect combination good. of, it was. it's almost like a navy teal almost. I don't yeah. know how to describe it. Yeah, It's amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful pen. So yeah, that was yeah. my, that was my Twisby pick. Um, and then- Yeah, like th- three out of the four pens I listed were all like dark teals. How about dark, that? Dark greens. How about that? Uh, my favorite Lamy special edition of all time was very easily the uh, Coffee All-Star. That's a good one. For sure. Yeah. That one, was that one? I think we. I think that one was still around when you started working yeah, here, right? Yeah, it was. Right? Yep. It was on its way out. Yep, I bought one. You did? Mm-hmm. Then I gave it away, then I got another one. Nice. Yep. All right. Um. So yeah, probably 2011, 2012. I don't remember what year that one is, but we, we yeah. got it in the blog post. Yeah, I think it might've been 20, 2011. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah. Very cool. All right. That's it for Q&A. Oh, and the, the Prussian blue was your your Twisby pick. Oh, yeah. You weren't disagreeing with me. That was also your oh, pick. Oh, yeah. No, that was 100% my pick. All right. You bet. What about like a Eco or anything? See, my problem is like there have been so many versions of the Eco. I can, I'm like, I can't really remember. Um, I will say, and I wasn't going to go here. I was ready to move on. Because there's like 30 different Ecos. At this I was point. ready to move on, Brian. I thought we were done with Q&A. But since you asked. I did ask. I'm going to go ahead and say a statement. Uh oh. Twisby does not have any brown pens. They did one. The McCarty. That doesn't count. 
It's a pen. They did it. They, they could make that pen. another color if they wanted to. It has to be brown. So it's ah, a brown pen. They made a brown pen. That's like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> they need a matte brown 580 AL R. Like the color of the coffee all-star. Yeah. That would look good. That would look good. Thank you. It would look good. Like an anodized yes. aluminum yeah. brown. That looks good. If they did like a translucent brown eco, I'd be like, no, mm. not so much that. No, thanks. No, I'm thinking brown aluminum. Um, what if they did like a, okay, so I, the problem with brown, especially in like a translucent resin, is it's like you're this far away from having it look terrible. Like You the, can make it work. The one that can pull it off, like the Pilot Custom 823, mm -hmm. that works. Mm -hmm. It's amber, technically, not brown. But like if you went like just a shade off of that color, I feel like it wouldn't look very good. And yeah, I feel like an eco would be too easy to maybe also, throw in that. Also, one. Twisby doesn't do gold colored hardware. I think that yeah, if true. they if they did a full transparent brown, mm -hmm. not clear and brown together, I don't think that looks good. It would okay. need to be an all transparent brownish amber with gold hardware. That would look good. But they don't they don't do anything with the body. The bodies are always clear. So it's you would only get not a if, translucent cap and like back finial. Um, I suppose it could be a swipe. They do they do have an all smoke swipe. And they have done all one resin uh, vax before too, back before it was the 700R. That was like the original that you're going back a decade I'm now. saying they did it, blue, orange, It has and been smoke. done, but they haven't done anything since then. No, they haven't. But if they, if they did a full, it would need to be all brown with gold or rose gold hardware. I mean, they, they could do anything. I mean, why, yeah. they could do. They've done gold. Oh my gosh, they did gold. They did a uh, cast resin pen. You're talking about that. That um, was gold hardware. You're uh, talking about that greenish. I, no, this was like a red and black. I don't like, remember that. Chunky, like quartzy style. Mm. I had I had the pen. I can't remember what it was called though. They didn't widely distribute. They didn't widely sell it. Um, but they did that with I think with gold hardware. Mm. Okay. But I mean, it's just a matter of plating. Like they could do gold hardware on anything. Yeah, sure. Interesting. So we'll that's my to, gripe. We'll talk to them. Seeing as how we have no sway whatsoever on what Twisby comes out with, but you know, one can dream, right? Yes. And okay. One will. Maybe that's, maybe we can go back to question one and say that brown will be the color of 2023. Yes. Are we going to let Drew be the tastemaker on that one? I don't know how I feel about this. Now you're gonna see my taste maker, my pain face. That's that's one of the uh, mm. that's one of the combos I always get whenever I order Domino's or Pizza Hut. Ten dollar taste maker. Is that what it's called? <laughs> it's like a buy two for ten medium pizzas. <laughs> I don't know. I like that pun because you're yeah. buying food like you're tasting. Yeah, food. You're quite taste, literal taste maker. All right, <clears throat> that's it for the questions. We got. A pen spotlight or some pens spotlights. Yes. Okay, so I did something different. Um, we didn't have a pen yeah, prepared. What, so I what, have like, you, what have you done, Drew? Okay, I went and got some random pens from your office. Okay. Because there have been people asking, like, "Hey, when was like when are you going to go through Brian's drawers again?" Um, and then uh, pen drawers, pen drawers. That is uh, obviously. Um, and then uh, so I did, and I said, Brian, I'm just going to tell you to pick some numbers, and I'm going to use those to go through your pen cap. Yeah, you got to explain your system because Drew was right. like, I just came up with a pick, weird arbitrary pick, system. He was like, pick three numbers between one and four, and I was like, well, technically, there's only two numbers. Of course, you did between one and four. Obviously, I meant one through four. You didn't say one through four. Oh my God. You said between See, one he doesn't just and act, four. He doesn't just act like this when we're in this no, room. This he is acts because, like this everywhere. This is because I have my children and they <laughs> they get super literal on me with every statement I make like this at home. So mm. I've just learned like you just got to be oh, okay. specific. So you picked like. I have a tangent on that, but I like won't do it. You picked like one, four, three, one, four, and three or something like that. So. I went reverse, so you have four cabinets in there. So I picked the fourth one, which is number one. Mm -hmm. I didn't go from one to four. I went four to one. Oh, that was the logic. Okay. Yeah, so I'll pick the first cabinet. Okay. 
third drawer down, which was your number three. Okay. And then second pen, you know, from the front. Okay. Um, but I didn't notice you have accrued more pens, Brian. Yeah. So you're double layered in I'm, there I'm, now. I'm, 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 I've officially exceeded yes. the capacity of my cabinet. So I, I have everything reintegrated back in there, but I have some brands that I need to like relabel and move things around. I have things that are outgrown. Homie got some pens. I got I got some pens. Homie got some pens. Uh, so then I had to ask you another number to figure out which layer yeah. I was gonna pick. I'm like, so I was like, all right, pick one through three because you got three stacks in here, bro. I'm like in my office, like working, and Drew's like, what's the number? <laughs> okay, like three. Okay, whatever. All right, give me another number. I'm like, just pick a dang pen. I don't know. Okay. All right, so you picked three, so I picked from the third stack, okay. second one from the front, and it ended up being well. I guess um, let me. I hope these are interesting because I told Drew I was like, I the first one, the first one's not really that interesting. Okay, great. Um, we'll look forward, everybody. Yeah. Oh, are you doing the phone? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get some video because this one's get a little... it closer up. Yeah. All right. So this is the first pen. Oh, what do you mean it's not that interesting? Well, I mean it's just it's a, beautiful. It's a, it's a Twisby Eco. It is. What what, what is this? Do you remember the Excuse name me, of this, this thing? Is it 580 ALR. 580. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what is the color? Is it like a lilac or something? It's a, yeah, I think it might be lilac. So it's a light purple or lavender. Yeah, it's like a lavender. I don't remember color. this one, but then again, I don't. It remember was it. uh yeah, it was a Twisby. It still is, is a Twisby. This is a couple of years ago. I don't remember when this came out because I don't remember anything anymore since COVID. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a really good looking pen. Rachel would know. Rachel would love this more if it didn't have the textured grip. Oh, is this, an, is this an ALR? ALRs are a non-starter for her. Oh, also, I found out that the R in ALR like means it. nothing. It yeah, it's like a, when you get like a Type R Honda yeah. or something. It's just yep. like whatever. It's just like when it they doesn't add, mean, add extra letters to cars. Yeah, it's like type, type S. What does that mean? I don't right. Know. It doesn't mean ridge it means or it's, ripple. It means or, it's faster. Yeah. It yep. doesn't mean anything like that. Good looking pen. Yeah, it is. Am I doing something? Am I commenting on it? No. Nope. What's happening? I mean, not unless you have some secret story We're just talking it. about it. I mean, it's a Twisby 580 LR. It's <laughs> just like every other Twisby 580 okay. LR. But this was a special edition I wish I could recall. This is the only problem with the impromptu stuff is like, I don't remember anything about right. this. Um, but this is a few years ago. We do not have it anymore. It's lovely. It is lovely. All right. I do like the color. All right, next one. Now these are the random, random ones. Okay. What the heck is this thing? Oh, this is a crone. A what? Crone. Crone. K R. So the big K. K R O N E. So German. Yep. Um. No. No. I'm trying to remember. All right. So you've got a carbon fiber. I believe Crone's an American brand. Carbon fiber cap. It is carbon fiber in the cap. I don't remember the name of this model. This was a sample pen. We were talking to Crone. Um, just before COVID hit. Or oh, maybe, really? Maybe okay. It was, maybe it was in 2022. Because I seem to remember having like lots of phone calls with them when I was at home. Oh. Um, so I think I'm... it was kind of like a during COVID thing. It's a it's a smaller brand. It's a it's kind of a niche brand. They've been around for 20, 25 years. I want to say they're an American brand. I, it's I, quite I, loud. It's It makes a statement. It definitely does. It's very, it, it it's looks, very regal. It, to me, it looks very like... A I'm, lot of their. I'm trying to be a Ferrari. I think they have a good reputation. The pen writes really nicely, but I think this pen's like a thousand dollars or something. What? Like, I think it's really expensive. Why? It's expensive. I mean, it's got carbon fiber. Is you it know, a nice gold nib. Cartridge converter. Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh my god. I could be mistaken. I'm I'm trying to recall. Yeah. But I think they have a lot of more expensive pens. Like I think they have a standard line of some more fashion kind like of colors. And then they have more like, it's kind of like Monograppa where they have some like regular pens and then they have a lot of other ones that are like in the thousand to $1,500 range that are like more limited in nature. That's kind of how the Crone does things, I guess. I do like the imprint on that nib with the crown. Yeah. It kind of looks like a Jinhao, like 159 <laughs> a little <laughs> bit, the old style, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a very nice pen. I like okay. I like the way it writes, but yeah, the, the cap is so much bigger. It's huge. Yeah, then, so it's like, I mean, it posts okay. Oh my God, look at that though. I don't know, I don't hate it. It looks like a hammer now. I was, I remember being a little more into this brand and wanting to kind of keep the conversations. Rachel was less than excited about mm -hmm. this brand in general, but it- The colors are a bit much all, all of the designs they have, I will say they are very, they, you will, you will have an opinion about every pen that they have. You, Divisive. you can't not have an opinion about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I just don't know how mass appeal it is, but Crone is a brand that potentially is something we could carry. It's very small, very niche. Um, 
and, and a bit on the pricier side. So if it's something y'all are interested in, let us know, please. It just, if you have any experience with Crone, we'd love to, to hear about it because it's a brand that we get, we would get asked about from time to time, but it's just not a brand that's, never it's had not a brand that's in the them. mainstream. Yeah. So okay. anyway, it is a nice pen. Though. And then I found this one that I've never seen before. I wish I had more information about this pen. Oh. This is, I believe, one that... It says it on the back. That, oh, I've never seen it. It does say? What does that say? I can't remember. Machine. Uh, machine Era. USA. I believe this is... Oh, my memory might be failing me. This is going back probably three or four years. I think it was right before COVID. Again, COVID wrecked a lot of things. Is that inked um, up, Brian? Is it? Oh my gosh, maybe it is. Yep. Oh. <laughs> it's inked up. Oh no. How about that? I think it's got a cartridge in here. Oh no. No. Yep. So years? Yeah, probably. Before COVID? Yeah, I don't think I oh, I don't think Brian, I've touched this since COVID. Goodbye. I believe this is if I'm not mistaken, I think this is one made locally. I is think that this the one is that, somebody is that the from one BK. That, oh yeah. I think this is BK's friend. Oh, okay. So I and I think they they're like a machine shop. I, they don't make pens. Wait, what's the name of the company? Machine Era. Machine Era. Yeah, I think I've, I think I have heard him talk. about I don't know it. if they really sell these or what. I don't know that they're available, but I mean, it's does the that pen. does that thread to post? Yes, like the yeah, uh, Lilliput. It, it does appear that way. Oh, kinda. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah, you can get it on there. I don't Interesting. Know why you, yeah, it's kind of. Is it? I get, like a, it's a pocket pen, I guess. It's a pocket pen. I mean, it's it's very thick. It's very durable. So, what is it? Is it stainless I steel? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about this, unfortunately. Okay. But well, it sounds I like know. I picked some good ones. Well, see, <laughs> at the time that we were looking into this, I mean, we wanted to expand our options and stuff. But like, mm. kaweco has got some metal pens. We had the yeah. Traveler's pen. We've had Keras Customs. We've had Tactile Turn. We've had, um, you know, some other like boutique kind of machine shop brands. And they do okay. We have Y Studio, so there is definitely like some interest in these like machined metal pens, but it's not the most popular, you know, no. across the board. And they're pretty. I mean, there's there's some options, but they. I mean, I don't know. They usually end up being in like the hundred and fifty dollar range or something like that. And it's mm -hmm. like for most people, it's like yeah, maybe not. So I don't know if y'all are interested. It's kind of a cool pen. Yeah. It just like it will roll off of anything. Oh yeah. Which is the only, but it's really sturdy, so. It, who cares? <laughs> nice. And apparently it seals well because I've had it for years and just been using whatever <laughs> stock cartridge that it came with. Right, I guess so. Whatever it, blue, you know, nondescript still... ink that's in there. <laughs> so it still wrote after a couple of years. That's a good... That's so funny. I actually have a tray of pens that I need to clean out. Does it actually write? I would think like, so. I, I mean, mean, it's one thing to stay inky, but it, is it actually still flowing? Oh my gosh. It's a bit dry, but... Still. Well, that, that's good now. A metal pen, a metal threaded pen that seals that well after yeah. it's got what, a uh, two and a half. It's got years? a Schmidt nib. It's the same Schmidt nib like you see on, um, like, uh, where is it? Where do you see those? That looks really familiar. Oh yeah, is uh, it some like the Banu, the smaller yeah, Banu nibs? Yeah, I think I've nibs? seen them on Banu. Yeah, so it's gonna be the same nib as that. Yeah, I'm sure they're just buying the nib unit, you know, from Schmidt, and then they're That's putting so funny. on those pens. I mean, that's cool. I don't even know if these are commercially available. I have no idea yeah. of price or anything. I don't know. But we had gotten a couple of samples and then I'd... COVID hit and then we haven't talked since. All but, right. Well, yeah. there we go. We did some random there you Brian go. pens this week. If y'all like whatever that was, then we can do some <laughs> more because I got a lot more pens where that came from. He does. From. I was having a hard time deciding. Yeah. Cool. All right. What's next? I don't have my notes in front of me. What's this, happening? This is going to be a short pen cast. It'll be on the shorter side. How about that? Though we've had some long what's happening yeah. before. All right. What's happening? Um, so first of all, I'm going to mention something that is currently irking me just to get get off my chest. I am okay. on book four of the Game of Thrones series, listening to the audio. The CD CDs, audio book yes. from the library? This is the third. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I do. I have incurred some late fees because they've taken me a while. I, curr <laughs> I currently owe $1.60 to my library. Whoa, racking it up. I know. They're going to send someone after me probably. Yeah. Um, so I listened to the first three books. Same reader. Um, his pronunciations are a little weird. Definitely different than the TV series, which is fine. Who knows? Okay. Like there's possibly no right way to do it. But then the fourth book started, and now all of a sudden he's he has different 
accents for different characters that he didn't have before. What? He's calling different characters' names differently. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're like, all of a sudden... Same narrator? Um, yeah, all of a sudden, Gilly became Jilly. And yeah, I'm like, Craster became Craster. So what are you doing, bro? You were just... So I come, come to find out, this guy apparently recorded some of the newer books and then went back and recorded the older ones. So the ones I listened to were the more recent ones. And then now I'm on like the more, uh, the older ones that like he read during the time of publication, I guess. Hmm. So either so way- which is the correct if he's like pronouncing I don't know. differently? I don't know. I don't know. I'm guessing, Interesting. I'm guessing probably the previous ones that I read were correct, hmm. but like- Like the, you would think that the, the newer it is, the more correct it would be, right? Yeah, so probably the ones I already listened to if he's recorded the, either way, like, man, I'm just, it just has been eating me up because I'm like, I've been listening to so many hours of these books. Yeah. I'm, I'm used to these voices already in yeah. my head and he's just totally switching it up on me. I feel like it's been recast, like mm. watching a TV show and pe someone shows oh, up and be yeah. like, hey, look, I'm Spartacus now. Like, wait a second, are you though? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah. like, come on, just consistency, man. Yeah. You're supposed That's to tough. be these characters. Anyway, but whatever. Um, I inked up some pens, Brian. Yes, so, you, um, my friend, challenged me. Right, we both had things to did do. Did you live up to your challenge? I did, I you did. did. You inked up, you were gonna ink it up with which? I don't remember what so it was. So I have this, uh, this is a Scriptorium pen in a Brooks resin that I inked up with okay. Diamine Oxford Blue. Oxford Blue, that's right. Yes, Oxford. And it is quite lovely, flowing mm -hmm. like a champ. Has a tiny bit of sheen in it, um, dries really quickly, and uh, is very, very dark and very, very blue. So I like it. I don't know if it's gonna, you know, jump to the front of the line as favorite blue material just okay. yet, but uh, I will finish it because this is actually broad nib and it, it's gonna go. Um, okay. Okay. And I actually, while I changed out my Custom Eight Twenty Three mm -hmm. for a, a ninety one that I got from Japan, hey, uh, it's got I, brown, nice brown still, look to I it. I know, right? It's like the same, same, same it's kind a of brilliant. It's a brilliant looking brown. Thank room. you. Yeah, it's flat tops too. Mm. Uh, but I kept Diamine Winter Spice because I've just been loving this ink so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm continuing with that ink. And then you need to put Winter Spice in your Christmas pudding sailor. Is what you need to do. I thought about that. I thought about that, but because it has some sheen and shimmer in it. Uh -huh. um, and my winter uh, spice is a medium fine mm. uh, Japanese pen. I wouldn't it show just, it off as much. It was a little yeah. much, yeah. It would match um, the pen nicely. Though. And then I went with my Miami Nights Edison Ascent, uh -huh. which is my favorite type of Edison pen, by the way. It uh -huh. feels so good. And I had been asked by a pen friend about uh, good purples. And I threw out mm. a few, including Yamabuto, but then I also said that uh, Rohrer and Klingner Solferino is underrated. That's a good one. And then I said that, I'm like, Drew, when was, what, what are you doing, you poser? When was the last time you actually wrote with Solferino? And it had been a while. I, I guess it, I guess I could call it a purple. To me, it's more of a magenta. It is. Same with Yamabuto. It, it is. walks that line. I think, I, yeah, it does. It's a very pinky purple. It is. So that that's it right there. Um, I yeah. think it's more of a purpley pink than a pinky purple. Yeah. But either okay. way, I was like, Super feeling like Is it a matte poser. black or black matte? Right, yeah. exactly. So I was like, Drew, go, don't be a poser. Go ink up some Solferino. So I did, and I've been writing with it and it's delightful. Yeah. It's in a 1.1. Like I do, I do. Again, not gonna jump up to the line of favorite purple because it is more okay. magenta uh, to your point. Yeah. Um, but I've been enjoying that. So those are my three colors nice. right now. Um, and uh, they're delightful. I've been uh, switching gears from angry to happy pens back to angry. Um, hmm. Been dealing with some bathroom, toilet, maintenance issues in my home. Mm. The tank has been leaking, so it keeps you know, fill, refilling when I don't want it to. Mm. Pretty sure it's the rubber gasket from the tank to the bowl. It's not um, leaking out of the toilet, right? No, just, no, 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 no. It's just, it's just like running. It's refilling when, yeah, it, doesn't, so it's, when it's, it shouldn't be. It's like leaking down into the, into the bowl. Yeah. And it's just, so it's yep. like refilling constantly. Yep. So That's I think annoying. it's I think it's the gasket. Um, yeah. So yeah. I went to replace the fill valve. Yeah, I need a new flapper. And then, uh, well, that's the thing. I can't just get a new flapper because it's this stupid type where the fill valve and the, no, no, flush valve. Fill valve, flush valve, whatever. The valve that goes into the bowl. Yeah. Um, it's, it instead of having a fill valve that just fills with water and then a flapper that just yeah, lifts up and down. That's the old school. It's 
a unit that just does this over a rubber gasket. Mm. So I can't just so replace- So it's like an all-in-one unit. Yeah, I can't just replace the gasket, which is stupid because that's the thing that's gonna go first. You're gonna, yeah. the rubber's gonna crack and that's yeah, why flappers are the most commonly replaced thing. No, I have to take the whole thing off yeah, now. Yeah, the whole thing. And that means I have to take the bolts off, which are totally rusted through and- The bolts? The what bolts, bolts? The toilet tank bolts. Like that connects the tank to the seat? I have to, no, I have to, yes, I have to remove the tank. Because Why are you throwing me the tank just to get the valve out of there? That seems crazy. Yeah, because it's all one piece. And the valve replacement part, yeah, it's it's so it's super terrible. I've never had to replace that valve because it's just hmm. it's just a it's just a post that fills with water. Like yeah. you, you don't usually have to replace that. There's nothing to break. But really. with this one, it's the stupid, it's all in one unit. So the mm. the valve and the flap are the same piece. Hmm. Mm. So I'm replacing it with one with just a standard flapper. So next time it happens, but I can't get the bolts out. It's a conspiracy. They're completely rusted through. Big, so I have big to, toilet is just trying to sell more valves. They're the worst. So I, I uh, my hacksaw wouldn't get in big there toilet. to cut the bolts, <laughs> the cut the bolts off. So I went and bought a little tiny hacksaw to get in there. And and even that, I can't get in between the bowl and the tank to cut them. I got a, like a little bit of a notch started. So mm. I'm gonna have to go buy another cutting wheel for my Dremel, because even like a uh, uh, um, an oscillating saw or whatever you call this, yeah. even that can't get in there because the space between the wall and the toilet <sighs> is like that. So I can't even get in there with- Plumbing is just- So I'm gonna have to get in there with my Dremel because that because that I can hold vertical and oh get in there and cut. So like I got- Toilet surgery here. Oh God, I just am- s <laughs> And every time I go and attempt something, I fail and I have to put it all back together so my kid can mm. use the toilet. I, have to, I taught him to turn the water on. Oh my gosh. Do the thing and then turn it back off so it doesn't consistently leak. I'm just mm. so done with that. And all this time while I'm in there, I hear the toilet in our bedroom. Is it doing the same thing? Start doing the same You're thing. You're gonna have to do this all over again. Oh, so I went and checked and the bolts aren't bad on that one. But okay. still like, oh my God, I'm just so done with it. Wow. I'm, I'm exhausted now. I don't even want to talk wow. anymore. Really, I'm just exhausting myself. It's anyway, it's really crappy. took down the Christmas really decorations. Yeah, there, you're right. It is mm -hmm. so crappy. Yeah. Took down the Christmas decorations. <laughs> they're inside now. They're oh. not up in the attic yet. Okay. But they're out of the yard. There, there's been progress made. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they're indoors. Wow. I just need to take them up. This is like the post-holiday, like- I know. It's, it's just, just like, as much work, but no motivation. <laughs> right. right. You just want to get it done with. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. And it's just- Little little steps, and mm -hmm. then of course are the things that oh here's an ornament. Well crap, you know now <laughs> yeah I already put everything away. Now it just goes into a random kitchen drawer until next year. <laughs> put it in the junk drawer. Yep, yep. Oh my god. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, this weekend was was solid. You know, uh, Archer and I watched a movie. Okay. Uh, we watched um, the second Planet of the Apes film from like twenty you know sixteen or something like oh, okay. that. Um, no, no twenty whatever. Uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Sure. So there was Rise of the Planet of the Apes and then Dawn. So that's the one we watched because we had already watched makes, Rise. Makes sense. Which he liked. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it was. it's a great, th those three movies, th these are not the ones with uh, Mark Wahlberg. That that came out in like 2001 or something like How that. How many of those have they made? Um, the original series, there was like five of them. Like what? In the 70s. They made that many? Yeah. I've seen the original Planet of the Apes. Yeah, that, that the original Planet of the Apes, I think, had four sequels. Jeez, I wasn't aware there was that many Planet yeah, of the Apes. There, yeah, there was um, <laughs> Beneath the Planet of the Apes, Conquest, Battle of the Planet of the Apes, hmm. and then I think there might have been another one. I used to, yeah, I have seen all those. See, I mean, and then Marky Mark did a Planet of the Apes <laughs> in like the early 2000s, okay. which everybody thought was terrible. I didn't mind it. Um, but I haven't seen it since the early 2000s, so we'll just leave it at that. Mm, but mm. then um, there was one with James Franco, and he did, Right. that right. one was very good. And okay. then he was not in the second or the third one, but uh, okay. they all continued to be really good. Huh. All, all three of them, it's one of those trilogies where all three are like just as good as each other. Wow. And very different movies too. Okay. Um, but they're all very much worth watching. And the CG holds up really, really well. Really? Normally, normally any computer generated animal with fur yeah fur always looks bad hair usually yeah. looks bad it's tough but I, I even after you know you know half a dozen years 
uh, you can go back and watch these and they look so real. Hmm. It really does look amazing. It looks nice. like these are actual apes right there. Wow. Um, and uh, Andy Serkis, who did Gollum in the Lord of the Rings movies, okay. does the motion capture for like the main ape. And oh, he's just phenomenal, of huh. course. So watch that. Enjoyed that. Of course, nice. Archer, uh, I said, hey, you want to watch a movie? So we walked over to the, you know, the big love sack in the den, kind of got it cozy on that. And he brings down his dirty clothes hamper filled with about 30 stuffed animals, dumps it on both of us. So oh. I watched the entire movie covered in all of his nice you know little friends so yep. oh yeah that was our kids when they were younger they used to like to get all of their stuffed animals and like line them up and it would like come out of their room and it would go down the stairs and all that i mean i think we counted one time there were like 160 animals or something like oh that because they both like are really into stuffed animals and they don't want to get rid of any of them oh i fully expect we keep... him to not want to get ready rid, yeah, rid of any of them yeah they're they all, always... they all names too. Oh yeah, so it says. But yeah. they're n not creative at all. No, it's like baby. Yeah, that was like... Ellie's little stuffed baby that she had, and then she had another baby, so she called it other baby. <laughs> okay, I, it's not I that am bad. not joking. <laughs> There's baby and other baby. Can you imagine like growing up and being like, oh yeah, this is my brother baby. My name is other yeah baby <laughs> other baby womp yeah young young baby yeah yeah um. Hmm. And uh, my wife was useless on Sunday. Totally oh. useless. This is the second time she has had some crazy allergic reaction in her eyes. They were like swollen up. What? Could barely see. Yikes. Terrible. I felt so bad for her. So she just like, she popped two Benadryl and slept all day. Wow. So that was when I think we watched the movie because there wasn't anything else to do, which was wow. great for saving money. We didn't spend like hardly any money over this, this weekend. Nice. So that was yay. Okay. Um, but I have no idea. That girl has so many allergy things going on these days. Yikes. And uh, yeah, we're trying to get to the root of it, but I think she's just going to be it's not really like swimming in her legs. season around, around here. I know. It? Like, we don't know it's what winter. it is. winter. Like, she called her doctor. She, they don't know what it is. This is like the best it's going to get in Richmond. Oh, I know. This is like one of the most allergy prone areas in the country it's in terms of pollen, anyway. I don't know what she did. Yikes. Like, the first time it happened. Hey, I'm sorry. It, like nothing between the first time it happened or in this time can we identify something that happened on both days we're just hmm. totally lost so yeah yeah that was a bummer she's feeling better now but uh yeah, yeah but i'm fine thankfully i know a lot That's of people good. around me that are still getting sick like a lot yeah my brother that had me COVID. A couple weeks ago my other brother has some sort of bronchial infection so i'm just like yikes I feel like something bad should happen to me soon. This just feels weird. Wow. Kind of feel spoiled. Well, the fact that I can just like breathe and move comfortably. Yeah, right. So, yeah, all in all, things are well. Okay. Things are well, no complaints. Yeah. I love watching movies. That's always really, really nice. Nice. I quite enjoy that. Good. What about you? Chess, I'm assuming. I did, a, did some chess, <laughs> yeah. I got a chess update. But first, you... Me? Lived, lived up to your end of the challenge. Ah, uh, yes. I also accomplished my challenge. You chopped down a tree? I chopped down a tree by hand with an axe. I watched a couple of YouTube videos first because I know how to I know how to fell trees with a chainsaw really well. I've done it dozens of times. Oh, yes. But it's a little bit different when you do it with an axe. Yeah. Because when you do it with a chainsaw, you cut a notch in the direction that you want it to fall. You There's lots of different ways you can do it. But typically, you make a back cut. You leave about 10% of the tree there called the hinge. You put wedges in the back, you smack the wedges and kind of nudge the tree over mm -hmm. and then it falls. Well, when you're cutting with an ax, you can't make like a nice clean cut yeah. that you can wedge. So I was like, when you challenged me first, I was like, how do you actually do that? Like, I know you do the notch and the whole thing, but like, what do you do? Well, it turns out you just like cut another notch in the back basically. So you like cut a notch in the tree mm -hmm. and then you cut another one from the back that's higher up. Cause when oh. you're cutting with an ax, you can't make just a straight cut in there. You have to like chop a, kind of a, a kind of a wedge, yeah. you know, wedge shape into the back of the tree. So you're basically just cutting out a chunk of the back of the tree. And then oh. basically the weight of the tree, it has to kind of naturally pull itself I didn't, over. I never thought about it one being higher. Yeah. I always thought you just kind of met in the middle and that's why you create well when you wedges. do that when you do it that way it could fall in any direction right, well, i just thought like the, yeah. the area the part you made the most chunk out of that's where it would fall no it's actually the opposite so you cut a notch that's only about 10 maybe 20 percent mm -hmm. 
from the front of the tree. So you, you know, say you have a 10 inch tree, just to mm -hmm. be simple, you wanna cut like one to two inches. That's how deep you want your notch to be. And then you're gonna leave like an inch, maybe two for the hinge and the rest of it out the back, you're cutting all that away. But it still falls forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. That's why you're doing it. That's why you're doing it higher. Oh. So like naturally the way to tree, of course, there's a lot of different factors. So the if big the tree cut is leaning or if there's crazy branches going main on. Main cut is higher than the little <clears throat> notch. The, the cut, the, the second cut, the one you're doing out of the back. Yeah. That one's higher. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So that the gravity sort of Just wants puts to take more, it in that put, direction. Puts more weight on the little yeah. wedge cut. But when, you're, but when you're cutting it with a chainsaw and you're just making a straight cut out the back, you know, you have a lot more options than you do when you're working with an ax. So when you're working, when you're do, when you're working with a chainsaw, and obviously not only is it less work to use a chainsaw because you're using a machine, sure, but it's like a lot safer, generally speaking, because you have a lot more control over where you're directing the tree to go. Mm -hmm. When you're doing it with an ax, it's kind of like wherever that tree seems like it's leaning, that's the direction you got to follow it. Because you, if it's leaning, if it's like back leaning or anything like that, you're not going to get it to go the other <laughs> way with just an ax. Yeah. Like unless you get a rope up in the tree and you're trying, you're pulling it. But yeah. if you're just one guy like working, that's kind of tough to do. Oh yeah. So, so did, did that take, did you take that into account when selecting your tree? Um, A little bit, a little bit. So the tree that I selected was one that I had my eye on so I've I've not really loved this tree. So those those poor trees. Every a, time you come out there, they're all like wondering well, who's normally, it going to be. So most of the trees that I poor take, Frank. most of the trees I take down on my property, I don't give them names because <laughs> uh, that just seems cruel. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Frank, nice to meet you. I'm going to kill you today. Just don't name um, any of them, Drew, and I won't take it personally. The m pretty much every tree I've ever taken down has been because it's dying and rotting, and it's and it's going to fall anyway. But I want to fall it in a controlled manner so mm -hmm. it doesn't cause destruction yeah. and like hurt other healthy trees, you know. So it's like, it's really like a, you know, forest management type of thing that sure. I'm trying to do. But this one with the axe by hand was the first perfectly healthy tree <laughs> that I cut oh, down no. because it's a Bradford pear. Oh, which are invasive. Oh yeah, they're thorny. They're awful trees. Yes. And it was growing in like the edge of my woods. Like it was not, it's not supposed to grow. Like Bradford pears, they're not supposed to germinate. They like- Terrible. They're crappy, cheap contractor landscaping trees. And for whatever reason, this thing was germinating and it was like maybe 20 feet tall, like at the edge of my woods. And it was like, you know what? This seems like a good tree. But not only was this thing an invasive Bradford pear, it was also surrounded by poison ivy, which I'm super allergic to. So earlier this summer, I had sprayed the whole thing with like poison ivy stuff and I wanted to make sure it was all killed off because I was like, the last thing I want to do is get all covered in poison ivy as I'm trying to take down this Bradford pear. So I made sure that was nice and gone. And then it was like, I've just kind of been waiting around to finally get around to this Bradford pear. So as soon as you challenged Perfect. me to do the ax, I was like, I it'd know. be very gratifying to just yes. like go to town. Oh, but, those are the worst. You know, I had, yeah. I, in my old house, I had a Bradford pear up at the front. Oh, I remember, you hated that thing. Oh, and well, cause we, I finally did get it cut down, okay. paid an arm and a leg for somebody to do that, cut two of them down. Yeah. And one of them died. The one in the front yard though, I dealt with the suckers coming out of the root system yeah. for like two years after I cut that thing down. Mm. And if you make the mistake of walking through the yard and you step on a sucker that's been cut by a lawnmower. Oh yeah. Just, Cause they're like thorns. Yeah. It's like a stick. It's a rigid, you know, and the pointy. Brand, the trees themselves, the branches, they have like two inch long thorns oh, that fall off and terrible. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the worst. Things. Yeah, and they're terrible. Like they plant them because they're cheap and they're pretty resilient for a while, but like they plant them in subdivisions and stuff like that when they do construction. But after like 15, 20 years, like the branches are crazy. They're super weak. So they break off all the time and Ugh, fall on trees and houses them. and fall on cars and houses and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, they're invasive. They're terrible to maintain. They're just not good trees. I want to say, if my memory serves me, Matthew Morse, hey, Matthew, who was on this pencast, you know, a while ago, said that in Georgia, they were doing this thing um, around his local government where if you brought in a picture of you having fell a Bradford pear recently, yeah. his government would give you a fresh sapling of a nice uh so Pretty like, happy tree. Like a trade-in? Yeah, it, it was basically like hunting season that? for yeah. Bradford pears. Yeah, because they're invasive. They're terrible. 
Yep. So anyway, we'll see if I get suckers that come so, up. So, so how did you feel about taking it down by hand? Um, it was, was it, gratifying? it was a little weird at first because it's a Bradford Terra rare, which is the worst tree in every respect. But it was like a, it had like a co-dominant trunk. So like two feet off the ground had the main trunk and then it split off to this oh, other. Oh yeah. Because the Bradford pears, the way they grow in one of the many ways they're awful is like they just, they grow so many branches and they all just grow up. It's like a giant and weed. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it was a bit weird because I was trying to cut it by hand, but there was like a pretty big, like maybe six, eight inch, like codominant mm -hmm. trunk that I was trying to fell, but it was leaning kind of hard away from the other one. Mm. So doing the back cut, I sort of had to do most of it like with a small hatchet because I just couldn't like, I couldn't do a big swing because the other part of the trunk was there. Yeah. And I didn't want to fall the whole thing because of how weird and big and spindly the thing was. I didn't feel like I would have a lot of control, you know, so I ended up cutting it down kind of in two sections. So the first one was a little monotonous just to get that first part down. But then once I did the main one, that was where I was able to like really get in the big swings. Do you listen to music during all this? Um, I might listen to music or maybe podcasts or something or audiobooks. Yeah. Okay. Listen to well, something. Yeah. I don't want to hear what you were listening to because in my mind, you should have been listening to some sort of like Viking metal or something like that. Oh. But, and I don't want to hear it. If you were listening to some Creed or something, then a lot don't, of times I'll listen, to the, I'll listen to the soundtrack of Hamilton a lot when I'm working outside. <laughs> bit of, bit okay. of a different vibe. All right. But you know, it's got some parts to it where you yeah, can kind of get okay. into it. Um, That's not so bad. Yeah. Or, you know, I definitely like, listen I can, to some, I can, if it was like, here comes the general or something like that, I could. Yeah. Could right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. My shot, you know, yeah. pretty appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah. But a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll listen to some music. Yeah, a lot of the times it's like, you know, heavier stuff. Good. You yeah. need that. Because like, Good you know. Axe music. Well, especially like when you're operating a chainsaw, it's like sometimes I'll try to do audiobook and sometimes I'm like, yeah, I just can't really hear no. any of the words very clearly. So I'll just put on some rage metal and just kind of have that in the background as I'm cutting things down. But I also felt a whole bunch of other trees. I was like, I did that one. I was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And I was like, maybe I'll try cutting some of the other things. So I did try doing like the... um uh, um, the limbing, you know, so it's like you cut the tree down, then you cut, you, it falls on the ground and then you've got, now you have a tree on the ground. Yes. You got to deal with it, you know? So you got to like, in order to move it safely and stuff, you got to cut all the branches off and then you got to cut it down into chunks and be able to move it. Well, I was initially thinking like, oh, maybe I'll like be romantic and I'll do like the whole thing by hand. Oh, I'll wow. Use any saws. Bradford Bear is not the tree to do that. Oh, There's so, so many, branches. many branches. Oh, no, no, no. Literally hundreds of branches on this Ugh. thing. Because every branch branches out more and more. And more. Oh, they're the worst. It's like a holly tree, but worse. But so. Oh God! Don't even with holly trees. I have so many hollies. I've I have done not a whole lot of like major landscaping in my life, but the things that I have done have pretty much been Bradford pears and hollies. Those are the worst. I know. Like those I'm, are all the worst trees. I had to dig down to the freaking Earth's crust <laughs> to get that Japanese holly bush out. I think every. Are they all Japanese? <laughs> the Earth's crust is like what we're standing on, isn't it? Like. Oh, I don't know. Or is there a layer on top of the... Oh, boy. I don't I'm getting know. into geology here. I don't remember anything. Oh, our teachers are right. <coughs> anyway. The crust is the outer layer, right? Like, we're standing on the crust right now. It's the crust? Yeah, right? I don't know. The mantle is below the crust, right? Oh, the like, mantle is what I was one. thinking of. That's yeah, what I was yeah, trying yeah. to do, the mantle. No, the crust is like we're... I didn't like, want to go core, because I'm like, don't exaggerate, Drew. <laughs> don't exaggerate. Don't exaggerate. The Let's... crust is only like, what... <laughs> <laughs> like 15 miles underneath or something like that. Uh, I'm kind of curious about this now. I went to the rim of the crust, like the crustiest part of the crust, Brian. Okay. What mantle, mantle. Okay. What are we on? Let's see here. National Geographic. See if you can help us out. Are we on? Mantle's about 1,800 miles thick. Whoa. Wow. So we're on the crust though, right? The mantle makes up 84% of Earth's total that's the volume. Red, that's the red part? That's the red part, Okay, yeah. so we're on the crust. Not the scale. So what's the orange part? Orange part is the not anyway. the core. Anyway, no one anyway. cares. <laughs> okay, no so one cares about this. The holly bush was awful. Like that thing, the roots Holly's terrible. stretched out so much. Like, hollies all so, throughout my whole garden. I have hollies. Most of what I have on my property is huge pine trees and tons of hollies. Pine and then there's fine. some <laughs> for a while. Oh, mostly they're fine. We'll get to that. But hollies. <laughs> So we have these crazy vines and stuff like that that like grow up into like grow like 70, 80 feet, climb oh, the yeah. climbs Oop. and go up there and like choke them out. Oh yeah. So like they grow all up in there. Yep. It's hollies. Hollies are doing that. What? And I'm like, it doesn't make any sense to me. 
and there's probably some other types of vines in there too, but like I've seen hollies do some of the craziest stuff because I'm like working in the woods and I'm like scraping stuff out and cutting roots and all that kind of stuff. I'll see like a regular holly tree and then I'll see like one of the like tap roots for the holly tree comes out, goes over like 15 feet and then starts growing up another tree and spirals. And I'm just like, what in the heck? See, that that makes me, so we were watching the Planet of the Apes movie, right? And it takes place San Francisco post like basically apocalyptic pandemic. Okay. You know? And 10 years after the pandemic, San Francisco is just overgrown yeah. with everything. And I'm like, oh, come on, 10 years, really? Mm. But what you're, when you say stuff like that, you know what? I'm like, okay, 10 years, maybe it would. Because some of these plants 10 are Ten years just, seems a little aggressive for that, but, you know, yeah, I don't it definitely know. takes back over. Look at Chernobyl, like how much like nature has taken that back over. Oh, yeah, well, that's been much more Even than 10 years. Even radiation and stuff. Yeah, it has, but, you know, still. Um, okay, where was I? We're getting on such a tangent. I told you we'd fill this Yeah, time. yeah, you're right. Um Okay, but I took down a bunch of other trees. So I made an effort this time. I was like, all right, I know it'd be cool if I could show me felling a tree. Yes. Lo and behold, I failed. So- Okay, well you said it wasn't safe anyway. I'm not gonna do it unless I feel safe doing sure. it. So I tried doing it with like a pretty sizable pine tree. You know, I had one that was probably 90 feet tall. Oh wow. Which is a pretty typical, yeah. you know, it's maybe 18 inches. That's gonna make a noise inches when it diameter. falls in the forest. Rachel heard it in the house. She said she like felt it when I took it down. And I was like, I don't know, a couple hundred yards away from the house at least. She couldn't see it. She couldn't see the tree, but she felt it in the ground when oh I when God. I took it down. Like, oh, that's just my husband <laughs> attacking nature. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and you're like, <laughs> you know, I'm like yelling like timber and like all this stuff. Cause it was like, I was falling across my driveway, you know? So it's like, I put cones out and I make sure no delivery drivers are gonna come down the driveway oh, wow. and that kind of a thing. Cause the problem I have, the woods are so dense. It if doesn't I, damage your asphalt? Um, no, because it's kind of on a slope a little bit. So usually okay. the tree and it, and it kind of breaks, you know, yeah. it's broken a little bit with some other trees that it starts to hit on the way down. But I mean, it gives a good little thump. Um, but yeah, so that one was annoying because, um, I, I was perfectly fine falling and everything, but I wanted to, to wedge it over. You know, I did the whole chainsaw cut, did the wedge thing and I was trying to, and I was like, okay, if I, if I feel like it's really stable and I know where it's going to fall, it's not going to do anything crazy. I can hold the phone in my hand while I'm hitting it with a wedge and then it's just going to go over. I'm going to have plenty of notice because it was a super tall tree, very clear. It doesn't, most of these pine trees, when they grow so tall, there's like branches at the top, but there's nothing else. That's what mine are. I have a couple of those in my backyard, tall, yeah. tall pines. The only problem. I hope they're not dead. The only problem with that. So I did everything fine. The only problem was because there's all that piney, bushy stuff at the top mm -hmm. that hung up with the tree that was next to it. So it was like, almost like 10 degrees over, still just chilling there. Oh. And here I am, this tree weighs probably at least 10,000 pounds. I mean, it's a it's a big tree. And here I am with these little like plastic wedges trying to hit it and, and nudge it over enough so that it breaks past that and then falls on the ground. So I have like five minutes of video of me smacking the crap out of these oh, wedges, man. trying to get this thing over and it just ah. wouldn't give. And I was like, Okay. Of me, course. The one like, time you can I was like, actually... let me take the wedges out. I just need to shave a little bit more mm -hmm. off that hinge with the chainsaw. And then I can wedge it back over and do the whole thing. So I need both hands to safely use the chainsaw. Yeah. So I go to do that. As soon as I make that cut, the thing falls down. And I'm like, Dang. freaking daggone it. Just missed it. I should have like set up the phone on a tripod or something. But it was like... Oh, well, I tried. So I have video footage of me smacking the wedges for like five straight minutes. And then I have... A video of it right after it fell oh, and shucks. showing it on the ground well so I doubt we'll, it'll be we'll the, throw that over top of the I, video here i doubt it will be the last time it won't be the last battle time, but the i'll see if i can get it but it's you know and rachel's even tried to record me taking trees down before but it's like you got to do it safely and it's like she tries to record but i'm like working and all that kind of stuff i can't really yell to her i'm oh, like yeah. i'm like 20 minutes I've away seen, from taking this thing down i've seen a video you know? where you know a <laughs> couple you know seemingly professional um mm -hmm. forest people we're chopping down a very, very large tree. Mm -hmm. And this tree, it's going the way it should go. Yeah. No problem there. But then it like it tears instead of snaps at the end. So it slides back Ooh, yep. and then catapults. It literally went under a guy's leg and launched, launched him up. above. And he goes airborne, lands on the the rest of the tree, and then slides off. Like That's terrifying. Yeah. Like you gotta I, be you gotta be so attentive. Like they don't just fall. They they can slide They're back. They're supposed go to up. Like, but that's, and that's the dangerous part too. Like, that's why I'm trying to take these trees down now before they rot out too bad, because there's nothing scarier 
than a tree that's like half rotten because then it does unpredictable things. Mm. If like the core of it's all rotten out, that's when you get weird stuff like that that happens. The outside of this tree seems okay and you go to cut through it, but the inside's all rotten. And then you go to cut it, but it breaks off and does crazy unpredictable things. So that's why my, you gotta be on guard. My um, great aunt's husband was killed by a tree. Really? Mm -hmm. oh. Scary. He, uh, I didn't know him very well. Mm. His name was Tom. He ran in like an excavation company. Oof. I think he was on a machine, but wow. yeah, that's how he died. Wow. It's dangerous. Logging work is some of the most dangerous work you can do, like as a professional logger. It's like it's up there with deadliest catch and oil rigging and stuff. It's that dangerous because it's nature. It's it's kind of unpredictable. So, yeah, who anyway. in the world would have this as just like a recreational hobby? This is literally my hobby. Yeah. Um, Weirdo. Yeah, it's pretty weird. <laughs> it's pretty weird. But, you know, I do it. I have a very yeah, I mean, healthy respect. If you're using cones and stuff, I'd say you're you're, yeah. you're already ahead of a lot of people. I got all the gear, the chat, the chainsaw chaps, and I, I would, I helmet bet you, and everything. I yeah. would be willing to bet you are in the top five safest lumberjacks of your county. Probably. I'm probably number two. Yeah, there's lots of like tree fail videos on YouTube. Oh yeah, I'm sure. You can do, yeah. Ugh. Um, okay, so enough about trees. Uh, you, mentioned, <laughs> you, you mentioned chess. Uh, Rachel. Played some more chess. Played All a couple right. of legit games with her, and uh, that was fun. She's she's being a good a good sport. She doesn't like losing. Who would? But she's she's pretty good. Uh, she's gonna be able to beat me consistently before too long. Um, so it's like a thing now. Now all four of us in the family can play, and we're kind of mixing it up. Who and it just who? happened so naturally. Well, Ellie's the one that kicked it off. <laughs> Ellie's the one that kicked it off. But I've de I've been the 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 champion yes, of making it happen. Definitely. But honestly, like I just kind of like leave the chess table or leave the chess, you know, board out on the table now. Joseph has wanted to play like every night. Ellie likes to observe and distract and make really bad recommendations of moves. Um, which is fun. But hey, we're all the kind of doing it and in it and we're spending quality time together. I'm like Cool. Like, if this is our thing, great, you know? Um, so that's been a lot of fun. And then we tried doing a timed game of chess for the first time. Because my kids, they get distracted. You, like, hit the like, clock? Yeah. Bang. So I, like, downloaded an app on my phone. I ordered, like, a like a, a dedicated clock, but it, it hasn't arrived yet. So we wanted to try it because it was, like, you know, it was close to the kids' bedtime. And that's the problem with having a regular untimed game is it can take a while. So I was like, hey, let's try it, you know, and we did the whole timer thing. That added a whole new element that made it pretty interesting and exciting. And that got Ellie back into it, too. We tried a, a game of bullet chess, which oh, is yeah, where you- Make it more you're... competitive. Ellie yeah. will come like oh, yeah. moth to the flame. Well, in a way, it does level some things out a little bit because you, like, we tried bullet chess, which is you have one minute per person. So it's like, you literally are like, you make a move, boom, and you're like- I like that. It's one so reason, fast. One reason you I just can't- make, You make stupid mistakes. No, I love that because that's the reason <laughs> I can't play these board games. Like, yeah. I just, I, my brain cannot stay fixed on it. Oh, well, that's, I mean, this, that's the beauty of chess. You can play these faster games. You can play three minute, five minute, 10 minute, you know. I would like a 30 second timer, like per move. That'd be great. I think great. a minute is the fastest. A minute is pretty darn fast. Right, but to, to level people <laughs> onto my playing field, like with my attention span, like it needs to be like, <laughs> Less than 30. Well, true. you and I, do you know how to play chess? Uh, I know most of the moves, I think. Okay. I, I get confused with the king and queen a lot of the time. Okay. But I know all the basic moves. play a moves. few games. And, also, yeah, I just sure. learned that if you take a pawn to the very end, mm -hmm. it gets more moves. I didn't yeah. know that before. You can up, No, you can upgrade. You can trade it out. That's it. You like king me. You know, like checkers. Sort of like that, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. Like my whole yeah. life, I never knew that. Like my son taught me that. Oh recently. man, that's a whole thing, yeah. yeah that's a whole no. strategy. Yeah. But I just get tired and I give up, which is funny because if I do that, if I do that in poker, sometimes I end up winning. Yeah. Um, because I'm just like, ah, whatever, you know, and no one knows if I'm bluffing or not because I get so impatient. Because you're so inconsistent. <laughs> yeah. So it, but yeah. It, it makes my brother Chad so mad because yeah. he's he's good at it. Yeah, and yeah. And I'm just like he can't screwing read around and yeah. no, I'm just a mess. And yeah. He's no. Chess doesn't quite work like that because like the pieces. You can't just get lucky. Yeah. You're, you're not going to like you have all of the information on the board. There's no, yeah. there's no like surprise element right, that's gonna happen. Yeah. yeah, so if you make like some stupid move, then they just take your better piece and you're just like, oh, okay, now I'm just, yeah. now I'm in a worse I'm spot. I'm just like <laughs> trying to match cards. I'm like, all right, I've got, I'm, I've got three kings. I know that's good. Yeah. But then I might also have something else that I'm not aware of. Right. Yeah, it works out sometimes. Gotcha. Like you, Ken, you, like you, Kenneth you, and 30 Rock. Yeah, but you can't, you can't do that but for so long. Eventually, yeah. you're gonna- They'll figure yeah, it out. You're gonna be yeah. dead. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's a thing. 
Um, and then um, not going to get into any details here. But we've had a lot of extended family stuff going on. Yeah. So, you know, we're dealing with some stuff. Everybody's fine, but there's some things. So that's been going on in the in the Goulet household. Um, but uh, that's been taking some extra time. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I'm doing, I'm, I'm re-motivated to do a little uh, organization in my, my wood shop. Um, so I um, have been a big fan of pegboard mm -hmm. for a long time. I'm a very visual person. So if I have things in drawers, I forget that they're there yeah. and can't find anything unless I label the heck out of everything. Mm -hmm. And then it's just frustrating. And a lot of things like a lot of tools, you know, you get like drills and saws. They don't fit well in drawers. Everything needs to be hung up. I like to hang things. Yes. Um, so there's a different type of system called a French cleat. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's a very simple concept. Um, and I've seen other people do it and I was like, eh, I don't know. But lately I'm like, mm, that actually might be a pretty good system for me. Um, so it's a very simple concept. The whole thing is you have some sort of like wood, like a plywood or something, like a three quarter inch plywood. You know, it's a couple inches tall, but you cut a 45 degree angle. And then you screw that to the wall so that it's got like the angled part is like kind of sharp and okay. from the wall. Sure. And then you do basically the opposite of that on whatever the tool holder is, or it could be a cabinet or whatever. So you're running these long pieces of like wood with a 45 degree angle on it. Mm -hmm. And then whatever it is, whatever hanger that you're trying to create, you can just hang it right onto and the two like 45 degree things kind of match up to each other. It's a very simple concept, but it's super strong. It's very versatile because you can just take and slide it and move it to different. So you set up- I can't these, visualize that, but okay. Yeah. So it's like, on you know, it's like if you ever go to a retail store and they have like a bunch of slats and you can take like brackets, like shelf brackets and like yeah. clip it in different places. Yeah. It's kind of a similar concept to like that. So it's okay. kind of a modular system, but it's very simple and super strong. Cool. Um, but the cool thing is a lot of people make, like a lot of woodworkers and stuff, make the hangers themselves, you know, that go onto the fringe cleats to fit the individual tool. So if you have like- So the fringe cleat is it like a saw, rail? It's kind of like a railing. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's like a rail hook system type thing. Hmm. So I'll show you a picture of it and okay. it'll all make sense, but um, it can be very versatile. But I was always thinking like, oh, well, pegboard's so much better because you can really like, I mean, the pegboard's like an inch apart and you can put the holes and stuff like that. But the problem is they can break and fall and they can the only thing, hold so much weight. The thing with and, me and the pegboard, because I, I have a folding desk in my shed that, you know, lowers and raises, but behind it, it's, you know, pegboard with the little things. Yeah. Whenever I pick up something off the pegboard, I run the risk of the things. That they come off and un, fall off. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's super you, annoying. They need to be having, they need to have downward pressure to yeah. maintain stability, but they have upward pressure, just ding, ding, ding. Yeah, like, oh, that's, that's a downside of it too. Yeah. And I've tried to hang like clamps and things like that on there, but it, it's literally like ripped the pegboard. Oh, well, mine's, you know, mine's it's too heavy. Mine's metal pe pegboard. Oh. Um, so it's like metal with holes, but yeah. still like it's- Well, that's stronger, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, the metal pegboard's a lot more expensive. It came with I the table. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. But me, what I do is I just have a pile of nails. And every time I don't, if I have something in there, I'm like, okay, put a nail into the stud. Boom. Hanger. That's go. fine. All right. I just, but I, everything's hanging up in there. Yeah. It looks like Ruby Tuesday or Cracker Barrel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So anyway, we'll see how this goes. I just, I just cut all the cleats last night. I'm gonna try putting some up and then designing some different things to hold the weird shape tools that I meant I to say have. TJI Fridays, not Ruby Tuesday. Oh, Ruby Tuesday has random crap on places too. I don't too, think they exist like. anymore. They're around, I guess. Aren't they all kind of the same? <laughs> I don't TJI Friday, think, Ruby I don't Tuesday, know. Applebee's. You know, they all, all they things. all have a, just a bunch of random crap on the walls, don't yeah, they? They're like, yeah. what's your, what's our decor? Oh, we're one of those restaurants that has the random crap on the walls. Oh, okay, I got you. I can yeah. visualize. Yep. Mm. Yeah, Red Robin's got a bunch of that kind of stuff yeah, too. Yeah, a bunch of random stuff. Flair. Got to have flair. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Office space? Mm hmm Okay. All right. Cool. Well, that's what we're up to. Um, let's move on to company updates, and then we'll wrap the sucker up. Let's. All right. Don't have a whole lot of updates here, but we did get out a video of the Pinter Avatar Twin Tank Touchdown. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So you get to hear Drew flapping about that pen. I forgot to say the price. In the video? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Price is tough. Everybody wants to know the price, but price has changed. So yeah. it ages out the video. I also forgot to say where the nib was made. Oh, well, you're just the worst. I know. Sorry. Oh, well. That's what you get with... Are you going to make it right here? Yeah, you're just going to... Bach, right? You just... <laughs> yeah, it's Bach. Okay. Yeah, they do Bach lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It uh, is, yeah, $200. There you go. 
See, you're, you're, you're making it right. Hey. <laughs> For the, the turkey hammock folks, you, know, you now know. You get the information. <laughs> Not like you can't it's go on the website. It's yeah. also on our website, yeah. Um, and then we're going to be closed this coming Monday. We have Martin Luther King Jr. <gasps> Day. Oh, yay. Holiday. We are going to be closed, so we're not going to ship any orders out or answer emails or anything, but we'll be back on Tuesday. So we'll be pretty caught up by the end of the week. But um, yeah, that is happening. Cool. All right. So let's wrap this sucker up. I want to thank everybody for watching. Please give us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions and stuff in the comments, and uh, we'll keep this thing going. Uh, check out gulepens.com for ink, paper, pens, all these needs. Uh, check out YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Facebook, whatever. We don't post there as much, but we're there. Google Plus. Uh, yeah. It's Vine. Fun. I don't think we ever had a Google Plus thing. Justin.tv. Justin.tv. That's what Twitch is now. <laughs> that was a precursor to Twitch. Did you know that? No. Yep. Oh, gracious. Justin TV. So the guy who founded it, his name is Justin. He started it out as a live stream of his life, like Truman Show style. Mm. And he turned it into Justin TV, which then was live streaming for everybody, which is when we jumped on board because we used Ustream and then be, we, we jumped on a Justin TV. And then Justin TV, they turned it into Twitch and he sold it and to Amazon and huh. yeah, did okay for himself. How about that? Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. So Didn't know that, that was- We were using Twitch before it was Twitch. Look at us. How about that? Anyway, if you want to email us, if you're an audio listener, you can email us at pencast at gulepens.com. And then I got a random fun fact for you. I'm ready. You. I'm ready. Um, this one's kind of weird. You know what's really odd, Drew? Numbers that aren't divisible by two. That was my math-themed dad joke that I said I wanted to try to work in here before the end. Snuck it right in. That has nothing to do with the fun fact of today, but I thought I would set it up well. This one's not so painful. This one's kind of cool. This one's kind of cool. Okay. Um, this one is about lakes in Canada. Okay. Are you, do I need to give you a minute to recover from the, the pun? <laughs> that was just purely aggressive. Yeah. That was, it was, it was that just was, a, that was, it was like a, it was like a liver shot. Just like a. <laughs> I'll tell you, we, we talk so much about how, how wonderful of a company culture we have here and. <sighs> keep, I'm glad, I'm glad you. I'm glad, I'm glad everybody here gets to see. Gotta keep you on your toes. That I do it for the fans, Joe. Yeah. I do it for their entertainment. He's not, he's not all good. <laughs> he's got a diabolical side. I got a dark side. <laughs> You're lying. It's just Drew. Everybody else likes the dad jokes. It's just Drew. Yeah. He's the only one that doesn't like him. Um, okay. Anyway, if you can recover, forgive me, Drew, for that. Um, mm -hmm. No, no. Some some fun facts. I was listening to just like a random YouTube video about geology facts uh, or geography facts. I think it was. I know. And I picked up this little tidbit, <laughs> did some research, and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, so according to the Canadian Encyclopedia, um, they've done surveys to, to suggest that there are over 2 million lakes in Canada. 2 million lakes. Natural in lakes? Yep. Holy which crap. is more than the number of lakes in all of the other countries in the world combined. Yeah. Like Isn't that crazy? we only have two natural lakes in the whole in the in state our of state, Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy? Um and why? Then, why is why is it so different? It's a very lakey country. I don't know. Oh. Um yeah, it's crazy. Um and uh they have a couple of very interesting lakes. One is uh called Little Manitou Lake uh, in Saskatchewan, and that is a saltwater lake just like the Dead Sea. Uh, and it's so salty that you can float on it. So I want to go to Canada. They call it the Canadian Dead Sea. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So that one's kind of fun. Um, and then this is the one that I thought would be really interesting because this is like Lake Inception here. Um, so there's a strange collection of lakes uh, found far north on Victoria Island in Nunavut. Uh, Victoria Island has several bodies. So this is an island that has several bodies of water on the island. But within one of those bodies of water is another island that also has a lake in it, which has yet another island in it as well. So it's like island and lake and island and lake and island and lake. Isn't that cool? Wow. That is cool. Yeah. That's a cool fact, Brian. Thank you. You've redeemed yourself a little bit. Thank you. I'm going to take back some of the things <laughs> I said about you. <laughs> Good. We'll leave on a high note there. Anyway, uh, I don't place. know about high. We're, we, we've gone back to zero. <laughs> I've from, gotten from you back the, from to, the negatives. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair We're enough. neutral again. Fair enough. I'll bring you back up off the floor. There okay. we go. There you go. Anyway, thanks for sticking with us. So glad to have you all here. We will see you next week on the next one. Thanks and right on. <laughs>